he go? Who? What do you mean, who? Didn't you see him? Oh, come on. Whoever he was, Miss Westbrook, he never got inside the safe. The metal's got a few scorch marks on it, but uh, it looks like the lock wasn't even touched. No thanks to you. How did he get past security? Uh, we're working on it. Well, work on it on your own time, because you are fired. Alana, we don't even know how it happened yet. Stu's worked for us for five years. Look, I don't care how it happened. It's time for a change. Alana, I have those contracts for your signature. Uh, later, they Scott. You were going to choose the girl for the national advertising campaign. Oh, not now. Oh, Lana, this is the third day they've been here. All right, all right. I think we can do better. Girls, I'm really sorry. Thank you, ladies. If there are any future opportunities, I have your numbers. Somewhere out there, there is a girl with the perfect look. Well, at least the formula is safe. That's the important thing. Yeah. And it is going to remain safe. That's why I'm taking it home. Home? Oh, Lana, you can't do that. The formula is too valuable. Well, you can't stop me. As CEO, I have a responsibility to the company and to your stockholders. You're going to do what you're told, Barbara, just like everyone else around here. You are constantly undermining my authority. If you won't let me do the job you hired me to do, then why don't you let me out of my contract? So you can become the CEO at Winston Cosmetics? Who told you? Oh, Scott is a very efficient and well-connected executive assistant. I want out, Alana. I want out. Oh, I understand. I understand Winston offered you $200,000 a year plus bonuses. Very generous. Too bad you already have an ironclad contract with me. Mrs. Westbrook? Dr. Shell, as I'm sure you've already heard, there was a break-in last night. An attempt was made to steal the ingenue formula. Yes, they didn't get it. I know, but uh, I'm going to take sole responsibility for its security. That's why I'd like you to turn over all your notes and files on the project. I, I don't understand. You don't have to. Just open the cabinet. Well, Mrs. Westbrook. Doctor. Now. Mrs. Westbrook, don't do this to me. These files represent years of work. They're irreplaceable. Without them, I would never be able to reconstruct the formula. You don't have to. I told you, I'm going to make sure it's safe. But I did not think it is fair that you retain sole possession. Doctor, I own that patent. Now, you developed the Ingenue formula as a salaried employee under my supervision. If you don't know what that means, I will be very happy to have my attorney explain it to you. All right. The cabinet. Everybody out. Thank you. Scott, we want you to call a press conference. Alana, I don't think the press is going to be that interested in a simple robbery attempt. Oh, I have a much bigger story than that. I'm going to tell them things even you don't know. In fact, this is a product so revolutionary that the competition actually sent burglars to try to steal it. 
Fortunately, they didn't get it. Are you telling us people are committing industrial espionage just to get their hands on some new wrinkle cream? Oh, no, 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 no. This is much more than that. This is an entirely new discovery that I've developed and I've tested on myself. I call it Ingenue. Remember that name. You know how most women lie about their ages? I know I always did. Well, today I'm finally going to tell you the truth. In fact, I'm going to show you copies of my birth certificate and my family records to prove it. Are you going to tell us that you're really 20? No, no, au contraire. Janice? Is this for real? Check it out for yourself. The original of that birth certificate is on file in Porterville, Colorado, where I was born. 62 years ago. Alana, what are the ingredients in this new wrinkle cream? Wouldn't you like to know? Well, that's certainly a triumph for you, my darling. Oh, thank you, Arthur. Uh, uh, please sit down. You know how I hate to have people read over my shirt. Oh, shirts. I'm sorry. Yes, you're right. I'm sorry. You know, I can't help feeling concerned about this formula being right here in the house, particularly after they tried to break into your office. Well, the formula's in my safe. You, of all people, should know how hard it is to get into my bedroom. Oh, come on, damn it. A lot of that isn't funny. Arthur, I'm talking about the security system. You have gotten so short-tempered. I used to be able to turn to you for, for help, for guidance, for support. Except for money. It was never just the money, Arthur. But now all I get from you is whining. Snide little rat. Who? Harley Griswold. This time he has gone too far. What did he say? Uh, never mind. Eric, have my car brought around in five minutes. Yes, ma'am. Are you going? Wait, the caterer is coming with designs for the birthday cake. Uh, that's all right, that's all right. They know what I want. And uh, uh, don't bother to wait up for me. I'll be late. You have something to do? Yes, sir. Then do it. Yes, sir. Harley, darling, are you talking about me? Alana, my angel, you don't look a day older and considering the vital statistics, that's quite an achievement. You know Beverly Courtney, don't you? How are you, darling? Harley, I want to talk to you. I'm so serious. I wonder if she's miffed because I'm having lunch with another of my lovely admirers. Oh, Harley, you're such a tease. Tease isn't exactly the word I had in mind. Have you read Shirley's column today? I have. You're in it. And what did I say this time? Nothing terrible, I hope. Harley's always saying terrible things. Beverly, darling, shut up. According to a well-connected writer friend, a certain cosmetic queen's dramatic revelation of her true age couldn't have come at a better time. Rumor has it that recent financial drains have left her beauty empire teetering on the verge of bankruptcy. You don't think that I tell Shirley about your financial problems, do you? Let's see, a well-connected writer friend... Why, Harley, I do believe you are the only writer I know. And you are certainly the only person who knew that I was having financial problems. That is, of course, until this came out. Alana, I swear I never said a word to Shirley. At least not that I can recall. Harley, you know, you drink too much. And darling, when you drink too much, you talk too much. Alana, my darling, what can I do to win your forgiveness? You can drop dead, darling. Beverly, I do hope you'll think twice before you tell him any secrets. You never know what might turn up in print. Darling? 
time. I don't believe you. You couldn't be 62. Oh, I don't look too bad, do I? For my age. That cream is really a miracle. You must rub it all over your body. Doesn't it ever bother you to be sleeping with someone almost old enough to be your grandmother? I haven't even thought about it. Do you want to know what I do think about? Why don't you tell me? a very effective little job you did the other night. Well, you said you wanted the break in attempt to look realistic. You were right to get your valuables out of that safe. The security around here stinks. Yeah, you certainly proved that to my satisfaction. Uh, what about that other little matter I asked you to look into? Well, it took some digging, but I think I found what you were looking for. It's not going to make you happy. Oh, well, you'd be surprised what makes me happy. Oh, everything all right for the party tonight? I think so. Great. Sure you won't come? Uh-huh. Chicken. <laughs> Have a happy birthday. Oh, thanks. Dylan. Oh. How's the new boat? How's your knee? Wet. The office has been trying to reach us for days. They finally got a message through to the store down the road. Important? I don't think so. Somebody named Westbrook wanted you to go to a birthday party tonight. I uh, said you couldn't go. Who's Westbrook? We went to law school together. Almost two years. You never mentioned him. Oh, five years out of law school, he went into business. Made a fortune. We were good friends. I haven't seen him since 77. How'd it go out there today? You were right. We were bitten to death. I yeah, didn't catch a thing. We're out of this tournament. Yesterday, the boat sank. Perry wrecked his knee, and we lost all our fish. We can go home, as far as I'm concerned. Those are mine. Alana, darling, happy birthday. Thank you. I can't believe how marvelous you look. I just pray that when I get to be your age... Darling, I... don't worry. Anjana will be out soon. I do hope you can afford to wait. Alana, my angel, I've been calling you for days, but you're never home. And I never will be home to you again, Harley. In fact, you weren't invited. Get out of my house. I was getting around that I'm no longer on your list. You've no idea the harm it's doing me. I couldn't be more thrilled. Oh, darling, for God's sake, you're ruining me. Wouldn't that just be a shame? Eric! Eric, Mr. Griswold is having trouble finding the door. Please show him out. Mr. Griswold, if you please, sir. This way. Darling, I want to talk to you. Arthur. Uh, Arthur. You must show me your guns, you know. I've been learning to shoot, and I want to ask your advice on what I should buy. Well, you know, I only uh, have target guns. Well, uh, what did you use in the Olympics? That's uh, the Walter 22 right there. That's a silhouette uh, pistol. 
بزنید thinking uh oh arthur darling it's so late not tonight uh, well good night darling i'm uh, happy birthday thanks Did I hear you mention having breakfast with the uh, Esmonds today? You awake? I'm, I'm coming in. How long have you worked here? I've been in the employment of Mrs. Westbrook for seven years. 
from what you've been telling me, it sounds like you don't like Mr. Westbrook. He didn't treat Mrs. Westbrook very well. Your name again? Eric. Eric, hang tight. I'll get back to you. As you wish, sir. Officer, I need to talk to you for a moment. I found something I think you're going to be interested in. Mr. Westbrook. Mr. Westbrook, Lieutenant Brock, please. Mind if I ask you a question or two, sir? I don't mind. Okay, to begin with, looks like a thief broke into your house, stole one of your guns, went upstairs and surprised your wife while she was putting away her jewels in the bedroom safe. Bang. He shoots her, grabs the jewels, and splits. And while all of this was going on, my guys tell me, you never heard a thing. Well, I take a sleeping pill, Lieutenant. It's very effective. I wish I had heard something. I might have been able to do something. Might have been able to do something. Lieutenant. Excuse me, sir. an update, sir, on what we think happened because something is not quite kosher. I uh, understand. Well, to begin with, sir, your wife's jewels were found in a mailbox just down the street from your house. But we didn't find the formula for your wife's anti-aging cream, the one that Dr. Shell told us about. Now, that means that the thief, if there was a thief, wanted the formula and not the jewels. Which means that the thief, if there was a thief, knew precisely what he was looking for. Why do you keep saying if there was a thief? I mean, somebody broke in here. <laughs> Mr. Westbrook, nobody broke into this house, sir. What about that window? Ah, Mr. Westbrook, the window, broken from the inside out. You see, the thief, your wife's killer, wanted us to think he broke into the house, but we think he was inside all along. Inside? Inside, Mr. Westbrook. In fact, we think he's still here. And we think we'll be able to prove it. Prove what? The butler says you and your wife, well, you didn't get along. Would you like to tell us about it? You should get started as soon as possible. I think you should change lures and fish the center of the lake. I was very comfortable on the dock. Oh, come on, Della. You were lucky. How about some coffee? Right away. You know, you really should get in a few hours before the sun gets too hot. Oh, Ken, Della knows what she's doing. Take it from me. <laughs> she will win the tournament. Mr. Mason, got a message for you. Head of the firm is there. Thank you, Admiral. What is this, another invitation to a party? <laughs> Not quite. Arthur Westbrook's wife was shot last night. And he's been charged with murder. The lawyer took care of the hearing. I took care of bail. Hey, Barry. I can't thank you enough. Too early for thanks. According to the police report, your butler told Lieutenant Brock you had violent arguments with the latter. Oh, damn that man. He'll be a witness for the prosecution. It's too bad you didn't get along with him. Eric is a butler. I pay him to get along with me. How long were you and Alana married? Oh, almost ten years. Did you argue? Well, of course we argued. Every couple argues, for God's sake. Eric says quite a few of your arguments concern money, Alana's money. Alana's money? <laughs> I gave her every cent I have. It was a lot. I just wanted to get some of it back out of the business. Arthur, do you realize that wanting your money back is enough motive for the police? What? They haven't found the murder weapon, but they did find the shell casing, and your fingerprints were on it. Well, they stole my bullets. 
We can't prove that. The DA does think he can prove you killed Alana to get the formula for her face cream. He'll claim you knew the formula was in her safe, and only you could have faked the break-in to throw off suspicion. Where are you? What, what are you trying to do? Get me more upset? I'm under arrest for murder. Thanks, Dylan. Sit down. My partner, Ken Melansky, is going to visit the crime scene with Lieutenant Brock in the morning. Before you leave here, I want you to go over all the pictures from the party with Della. But right now, I'd like you to tell me about this cream your wife invented. It really worked? Oh, yes. Arthur, how old was Alana? I haven't the slightest idea. Morning, Lieutenant. Morning, Miss Melansky. Sorry I'm late. Go on in. What do we got? Excuse me. Mind if I take a look around? Who are you? My name is Melansky. Ken Melansky. I work with Perry Mason. Mason, the lawyer? You're a lawyer too, Melansky. <laughs> Don't tell me you got something against attorneys. Ever know a cop who didn't? Who said you could be in here? Lieutenant Brock. He's outside. Ask him. I will. In the meantime, don't go anywhere. Don't touch anything. Clear? You're not going to find anything, Melansky. Forensics swept the place clean yesterday. I mm, had to tell your investigator that she acted like I was trying to sneak out with vital evidence. What investigator? Tall, blonde, nice looking. She was going to go look for you. She was just here. Just now? Yeah, just now. She just drove away. It wasn't one of yours? The only woman on my squad is Lenny Rodriguez, and she ain't no blonde. She had an ID, Lieutenant. Darius Quinn. I wrote her name and license number in the law. Turn the one, it's a dead end. This is not another one of Mason's scams, is it, Melansky? Getting us running around in circles looking for some mystery woman? Give me a break, Lieutenant. Perry and I don't work that way. <laughs> you don't know that by now. After you. Arthur and I went through every picture from the party. These three knew the formula was in the house. William Shell? Mm -hmm. The chemist who developed Ingenue. Barbara Fox? Alana's CEO. And Scott Collins? Her executive assistant. You're holding one back. Harley Griswold. Arthur said that he and Alana had a terrible fight the night of the party. Fight? About what? He only knew that Harley crashed the party and Alana threw him out. Well, Mr. Melansky. Sorry I'm late. I was downtown with Lieutenant Brock. He traced our mystery woman's license plate. Rental car, phony name, dead end. She's evidently a professional. Professional enough to murder? I'm starving. Have you ordered yet? No, we've been waiting for you. Waiter! Arthur identified four suspects today. No, tomorrow... You want me to check out that break-in at Alana's offices because it's connected. You're finished with everything else. Everything jibes with the official police report. Well, Rock is certainly putting together a good case against us. I just got a glimpse of him going down the hall, all in black with some kind of mask over his head. That's all I saw. This intruder, you think it could have been a woman? I don't know. I didn't think about it. In other words, you wouldn't say yes, and you wouldn't say no. I'd say maybe. More than that, pal, I don't know. Mr. Collins' office is around the corner down the hall. Great, thanks a lot.
Who? The blonde woman. I didn't see anybody. Excuse me. Can I help you? I'm looking for a woman. Call? Blood? Not in here. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Long line. Uh, tall blonde wearing a white blouse and a dark skirt. I saw her coming out of that office there. It's gotta be Lauren Kent. She was here a few minutes ago. Who is she? She worked for Alana. Doing what? Special projects like the party, occasional dirty tricks, stabs in the back. Whatever Lauren Kent was doing, Alana kept secret. Well, she doesn't work for Mrs. Westbrook anymore. Now, what was she doing here? She said she had some loose ends to tie up. So do I. You know how I can find her? Well, her employment file's in the computer. That's funny. I can't bring her up. Her file's been erased. Could she have gotten her hands on one of those terminals? Well, there's another one in Mrs. Westbrook's office. When she was in there, I... You don't think that she could have erased it herself, do you? Now, there's a thought. Did you pay her by check? She picked up her last one today, yeah. You have any of the canceled checks? The name of her bank will be stamped on the back of the check. Hello? I'm back, Ken. Good, Lauren Kent's here. Why should I talk to you now, Mr. Malinsky? Either here and now, Ms. Kent, or on the witness stand under oath. Suppose I just disappear. We'll find you. And then you can explain to Lieutenant Brock what you were doing at the Westbrook mansion impersonating a police officer. My name is Lauren Kent. I'm a PI. Here's my license. I've known Alana since I was a kid. I did a couple of jobs for her and then she hired me on a permanent basis. What were you working on? She had me checking out some of her employees. Alana wasn't exactly what you'd call a trusting person. Your employer is dead. Why are you still investigating? I want to find out who killed her. You don't think it was her husband? No. For some inexplicable reason, Arthur loved her. Why do you care who it was? Two reasons. First, I have this old-fashioned idea that anyone who commits a murder should be punished. Call me crazy. And second? If I solve this case, I'll never have to hustle for another job. I'll be famous, and like Mr. Perry Mason, the jobs will come to me. Does it work that way, Ken? Look, Mr. Mason, we both believe that your client is innocent. Maybe we can help each other. Have you spoken to Harley Griswold? Why? Alana was worried about him. Seems he has a temper. Seems he's dangerous when he's crossed. Well, he doesn't look very dangerous. Mr. Mason... You, of all people, ought to know just how deceiving looks can really be. That's very true, Ms. Kent. Isn't that so, Mr. Malansky? 
Mason? Mr. Griswold. You're sitting at my table. Yes, I know. Won't you sit down? Sit down. Thank you. Uh, Beverly Courtney, this is the uh, famous Perry Mason who is attempting to pull dear old Arthur's bat out of the fire. Yeah, uh, you tell us about Arthur's struggle for justice. Must be an uphill battle. All struggles are uphill. Dear Arthur has such a charming personality that I'm afraid most people would be quite happy to see him in jail, innocent or not. How about you, Mr. Griswold? Do you think he's innocent or not? Well, even if he did kill Alana, who'd blame him? She treated him badly. Very, very badly. Everybody knew it. And you? Did she treat you very badly? We had our ups and downs. Well, Harley, you're being too kind. Why, the woman was a monster. You should have heard the way she spoke to him. I never would have put up with it. Anything further, Mr. Mason? Perhaps now is not the time. Oh, you can say anything you want in front of Beverly. God knows I always do. Go ahead, Mr. Mason. I love a little scandal. All right. Is it true you were taking large sums of money from Alana Westbrook? Who told you that? Is it true? Well, she gave me little gifts from time to time. Gifts of cash? Well, Alana was very generous. That's how you live, isn't it? Well, I, I accept the uh, generosity of uh, some of my devoted lady friends, yes. So your falling out with Alana endangered your livelihood? I... I think I should probably leave you two alone after all. Thank you, Mr. Mason, for your exquisite sense of discretion. My sense of discretion was your idea. Now, you left Alana's birthday party at about 10 o'clock. Where did you go then? Home. Which is where I'm going now. Good day, Mr. Mason. Why don't we just say au revoir? I'm sure we'll be seeing each other again. I think I got us a killer. I told Harley Griswold that I have a photo of him sneaking back into the Westbrook house the night of the party. I also told him for $10,000 I'd sell him the negative instead of giving the photo to the police. You can't do that. That's blackmail. Not really, because there isn't any photo. But if he thinks there is and he tries to buy it, we've got our man. <laughs> Perry's gonna love this. Well, it's a good thing we didn't ask his permission, isn't it? Tell me something. Are you really as tough as you act? Stick around and find out. Griswold told me that he'd get the money and he'd meet me at the Grillo Center parking lot at 10 p.m. tonight. All he's got to do is show and we've got him. Oh, oh, yes. The original idea for Ingenue was mine. We met in Switzerland 20 years ago. I was in research and development, she in marketing for a Swiss cosmetics firm. We began working on an age-reversing skin product then. Did she bring you to America? Alana was obsessed with this research of mine. When she set her company up, she sent for me, made me her chief chemist. She'd be the first to tell you that my contribution to Ingenue was essential. Unfortunately, she isn't in a position to tell us anything. Unfortunately, no. <laughs> Twenty years I've worked on this project. 
And because my notes were destroyed, I can offer no proof of my contribution or even reconstruct the formula. Alana destroyed your notes. Weren't you worried she might use that to cut you out of your share of the profits? Alana was my friend. She always dealt honorably with me in the past. I trusted her implicitly. Even though she had the only copy of your formula in her bedroom safe? Yes. You knew that's where it was? She told me herself. A lot of Westbrook trusted me, Mr. Mason, and I trusted her. I was probably the only person at the company she did trust. What about Lauren Kent, Barbara Fox? Lauren works part-time. But are you aware that Barbara Fox and Alana had a falling out the very afternoon she took the formula home? Falling out over what? Barbara had made some bad investments and covered them with company funds. When Alana found out, she threatened Barbara's career. If you're looking for a motive, Mr. Mason, Possibly you should talk to Barbara Fox. Ingenue projects millions in profits, Dr. Shell. That's plenty of motive for any number of people. Daddy's bound to have a good one, and after tonight, he's gonna need some repairs. Lori. Lori! Hey, it's breaking and entering. So Griswold tried to kill us. We're even. You coming? No! You can't do that! Watch me. from Schönheit Gesellschaft, and I'm leaving this message to confirm that I will be meeting your flight when you arrive here on the 19th, as per your fax. I wish you a safe journey. Goodbye. Schönheit means beauty, Gesellschaft means corporation. I know that! Griswold is meeting with someone from a Swiss cosmetic firm. Maybe he's got something to sell. What do you think? pride myself on my coffee. Can I take your coat for you? No, I won't be staying long. I, I take it back. A purist after my own heart. So what can I do for you, Mr. Mason? Tell me about the argument you and Alana Westbrook had the night of her party. I wouldn't really call it an argument. No? I understood she looked very angry. Well, an executive assistant either learns to take his boss's heat or he finds another job. But your relationship went far beyond work, didn't it? What do you mean? My friends have been doing a little research on your standard of living. The rent on this apartment alone is more than your monthly salary. 
I have investments. Mr. Collins, both your rent and the lease on your car have been paid by checks drawn on one of Alana's private accounts. So what's your point, Mr. Mason? That I'm a kept man? That Alana and I were lovers? More or less? Well, you're right. So what does that prove? That gives me a motive to want her alive, not dead. Yes, she paid for my rent, my car, my clothes. But now that she's dead, that's all over. Did you know you were extremely well provided for in her will? I don't have to answer that question, Mr. Mason. You don't have me on the stand yet. Oh, but I will, Mr. Collins. I will. Morning. Morning, sir. How can I help you? Looking for a Jaguar Mark II sedan, early 60s. Want to buy a classic Jag, do you? Come to the right place here. Actually, I'm looking for one in particular, a dented left front fender, a wing, you'd call it. Mind if I take a look through your service base? Wouldn't be one of them insurance blokes, would you? No, I'm an attorney. I'm working on a murder case. Name's Melansky. Sir? So? so, I can get a court order to look through your books and your service base. Well, why make things difficult on both of us? Bloody lawyers. Come on. Hey, huh? Is that what you're looking for? Yeah, that's it. Who does it belong to? Oh, come on, mate. There's a limit. I've got to respect the confidence of my customers. I can understand that. Mr. Griswold wants to keep this under wraps, doesn't he? If you know everything already, why ask me? Bloody lawyers. Mr. Mason, Barbara Fox. Um, my secretary told me you were waiting. I, I've been expecting a visit from you. Really? Well, ever since the head of accounting told me your Della Street was trying to get a look at the company books. You had the book sealed, Miss Fox. I was hoping I could persuade you to change your mind. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, but the company's financial records are strictly confidential. But now that Alana's dead, you must control the company funds. Uh, that's correct. Big responsibility. I can handle it. For the time being. Eventually, of course, uh, there'll be an audit. With the books closed, people could imagine you might be trying to hide something. Mr. Mason, the books are in order. Ah. Uh, I'm relieved to hear that, Ms. Fox. This is a subpoena deuces take him. It requires you to be in court tomorrow morning. It also requires your books to be there. Also, das weiß ich. Herr Messen wird Sie im Sommer, wenn er in Holland im Haag ist, anrufen. <lacht> ja, ja. Dankeschön, Herr Direktor. Auf Wiedersehen. Carl Schlusner says I need to work on my accent. Anyway, Griswold faxed him there yesterday, saying he was coming into Zurich next week in order to discuss a significant business proposition involving a new product. Unfortunately, Griswold wasn't any more specific than that. His travel agency said that Griswold faxed them two days ago, requesting a one-way ticket to Zurich on the 18th. He contacted both of them by fax. Mm -hmm. What's the problem? Well, I'd feel better if he'd spoken to them. Anyone could have sent those faxes. To implicate Griswold. Perry, he tried to kill us last night. That proves he's our man. Does it? I show you State Exhibit G. Do you recognize this shell kitchen? Ah, uh, yes, it has my mark on it, and it was found in the room where Lana Westbrook was killed. 
Now, is this casing similar to the ones used by the defendant for target shooting? Yes, it was compared to other bullets found in the defendant's house. That's an exact match. Were any fingerprints found on uh, this casing? Yes, the defendant's. Uh, Lieutenant, do you have an inventory of what was taken from Mrs. Westbrook's bedroom safe? Uh, yes, we do. Several items of jewelry and an envelope containing a chemical formula for a cosmetic cream. But we found the jewelry in a mailbox down the street from the house. You mean the jewelry wasn't really stolen after all? No, it wasn't. And did you find the chemical formula too? No, we didn't. So the only thing that was stolen from Mrs. Westbrook's safe was the formula for her cosmetics cream? That is correct. Now, let's talk about the broken window in the living room. The window was broken, was it not? Yes, it was. Lieutenant, when you examined the area around the broken window, what did you observe? I discovered that there was a lot more broken glass on the windowsill outside than there was on the floor inside. Indicating what? Indicating that the window had been broken from the inside out. Meaning that whoever broke the window was already inside the house? That is correct, sir. At the time of the murder, were the servants still in the house? No, they had already returned to the gatehouse where they lived. So who was in the house? Mrs. Westbrook and the defendant, Mr. Westbrook. Your witness, counsel. Defense has no questions, Your Honor. Witnesses dismissed. Your Honor, the people call Eric Corbell. Why don't you say something? Some fine, there's nothing to say. Then what did these arguments between the defendant and Mrs. Westbrook concern? Do you recall? Sometimes they were because he was jealous of other men, but mostly they were about money. What about money? He said that she owed him. He'd given her a fortune, and now he wanted his money back. Hmm. And what did Mrs. Westbrook say to that? She just laughed. Tell him he'd get his money over her dead body. Your witness, counsel. Defense has no questions. It's impossible to put a specific dollar value on it, but conservatively speaking, I would say that the ingenue formula could be worth tens of millions of dollars. Was the defendant aware of the value of the formula, Dr. Shaw? He was at the board meeting when we first discussed it. I'm certain that he knew. Counselor, your witness. Your Honor, defense has no questions for the witness at this time. In that case, Your Honor, the people rest. Very well. Witness is dismissed. Counsel for the defense, you may call your first witness. Your Honor, defense calls Harley Griswold. We ask the court's indulgence to treat Mr. Griswold as a hostile witness. The court will grant you a certain leeway, Mr. Mason. Hmm. Mr. Griswold, I'd like to direct your attention to the young lady in the second row of the spectator section. Have you ever seen her before? Yes, yeah, she came to my house the day before yesterday. And at that time, did she offer to sell you an incriminating photograph linking you to the murder of Alana Westbrook? She most certainly did not. She said she was a reporter from the National Informer and she wanted to interview me for a story on cafe society snobs. I threw her out. I can put the young lady on the witness stand if necessary. You can do what you want at your trial. I'm telling you the truth. What kind of car do you drive? 1961 Jaguar Mark II, 3.8 liter sedan. British racing green. Your vintage car was involved in an attempted vehicular homicide two nights ago, was it not? If you say so, it must be true. The left front fender of your car was severely damaged, was it not? Yes, it was. In fact, that car belonging to you is at Imperial Motors having that fender replaced. Is that not true? Yes, that's quite right. My Jaguar was stolen from its garage that evening. I found it the next morning, parked around the corner with just the damage you describe. You're telling us someone stole your car, smashed it up, and then returned it? Why would someone do that, sir? Well, I, I suppose someone uh, might be trying to implicate me in some way to uh, set me up. 
in the language of the streets. Why didn't you report the theft and the damage to the police or to your insurance company? Well, every time I try to make a claim, they raise the rates. It's cheaper for me to pay for the repairs myself. <laughs> now, we've heard testimony about the value of the Ingenue formula. Isn't it a fair assumption that whoever murdered Mrs. Westbrook and stole that formula would be interested in selling it? Yes, I suppose so. But if you're going to ask me about that telephone call from Zurich on my answering machine, I promise you I know nothing about it. You have no plans to travel to Zurich to meet with representatives of a Swiss cosmetics concern? No, I don't. And after Alana's murder, why did you fax your travel agent and order a one-way ticket to Zurich? I didn't. Mr. Griswold, this is the fax that your travel agent received. It indicates that it came from your home. I wasn't at home at that time. Somebody must be trying to impersonate me. The same someone who stole your car? Yes. The same someone who faxed a cosmetics company in Zurich and asked for an appointment in order to discuss vital business concerns? The same someone who's trying to frame me. Yes. Do you have an alibi for the night of the murder? Or for the night that your car was involved in that accident? I was at home. No, you weren't. You left Alana Westbrook's birthday party at 10 o'clock. But according to your houseboy, you didn't arrive home until 2 a.m. Now that's four hours. Four! Where were you during those four hours, Mr. Griswold? I'm not on trial here. I don't have to furnish an alibi. The witness will answer the question. Your Honor, this is a very, very personal matter. Didn't you kill Alana, Mr. Griswold? And when Lauren Kent confronted you with proof of your guilt, didn't you try to kill her also? No. Then where were you the night Alana was killed? Oh, for heaven's sake, Harley, tell them. He was with me. Order. Order. Madam, you will be seated and you will be quiet. I was with Mrs. Courtney. Witnesses? <laughs> really, Mr. Vex, there were no witnesses. You see, I'm not quite the impotent eunuch that people like to think. Dear Mr. Courtney has allowed me to spend as much time as I want with his lovely wife under the mistaken impression that all we do is gossip and have lunch. Well, thanks to you, my cover's blown. Pity. It was rather nice to be out of the closet. Mr. Mason? Mr. Mason? Your Honor, defense requests a short recess. Court is in recess for 20 minutes. All right. Lawrence set us up. Find her. Mr. Collins, is it not true that you and Alana were lovers? Objection. Irrelevant. Overruled. Yes, we were lovers. And when her husband found out about us, he threatened to kill her. Your Honor, may we mark these photographs for identification as defendants next in order? Yes, they may be marked collectively as defendants exhibit C. Thank you. Now, Mr. Collins, you say you were Alana's lover. Yes. Would you identify these photographs, please, Mr. Collins? They're pictures of me with a friend of mine. 
a young female friend, and the nature of the friendship is quite clear. Now, Alana was given those photographs on her birthday, was she not? You argued with her over those photographs, did you not? Yes. She was upset. What was she going to do, Mr. Collins? Nothing. Nothing? Nothing. To make certain she did nothing, you got rid of her. Objection. Defense is badgering his own witness and attempting to introduce speculation as to motive when there's not a shred of evidence linking Mr. Collins to this crime. Sustained. Mr. Mason, that is enough. Now, do you have any more questions for this witness? Just one, Your Honor. Mr. Collins, did you kill Alana Westbrook? No. Mr. Mellers? No further questions, Your Honor. Witness is dismissed. Court is in recess. One hour for lunch. All right. Why didn't you leave her alone? Leave her alone. I told you. Court. Court. Bailiff, separate those two men. why you weren't anxious to hang around after you stiffed us with Griswold. Get out of my way, Melissa. No, I'm not going anywhere because Let you and I got some things What's the trouble, Miss Kent? Kenny, I told you I don't want to go out with you anymore. Now I'm going away. Can't you just accept oh, that's that? that's cute. Real cute. You are the lady. Now be mature. Hey, you're totally you... getting the wrong... You okay, Miss Kent? I am now. Yeah. What'd you say? Thanks, Eduardo. I want to testify, Perry. I want to tell him the truth. Whose truth, Arthur? Yours or the prosecution's? The truth. I loved Alana. I, I could never have killed her. You were never angry at her? Oh, we had our disagreements. But... Because she was seeing another man. Scott Collins never mattered to her. She left him a small fortune from money you gave her. Well, it was her business. But your money, you must have hated her. No. But she betrayed you, made you look like a fool. Damn it, no. No, she didn't betray you or no, you weren't a fool. Just shut up. Will you shut up? Now that's why I won't let you testify. I'm sorry, Arthur. I know you didn't enjoy that. But I had to make you understand. The prosecution will play on your temper and make you look like a man out of control. Capable of any crime, the least of which is murder. My God, Barry, what are we going to do? Hey, I thought I told you to take a hike. Now we're even. caught you. Listen, I thought you should know your boyfriend was up in your apartment. I don't know what he was looking for. I do. Thanks, Eduardo. Operator, I need to make another call using my credit card. The number I'm calling is 303-555-555-4128. Thank you. Yeah, it's me. We got trouble. I think that Laurie Malansky's gonna follow me here. Here, Porterville. I don't know, I think he broke into my apartment and I'm sure he found something that's gonna lead him down here. Well, I'm headed back to the house right now, but I'm afraid he's gonna follow me there. 
Yeah, I can do that. What road is that? Yeah, I can do that too. Now, I'll make sure he's behind me when I get there. from Denver. Guess you get a lot of cars pulling in here running on empty, huh? A friend of mine was driving up this way. I was wondering maybe if she filled up here. Tall blonde lady. Good looking. Did you see her? Guess not. You take credit cards? Great. You got a restroom? Great. Why don't you pop the hood and check the oil? Look, my name's Molansky. I'm an attorney working on a murder case, and this lady, Lauren Kent, is a crucial witness. I need to find her. Now, she was here. You must have seen her. A tall, blonde, good-looking lady. In a town like this, she'd be hard to miss. Really? All right, I'll tell you what. You tell me where she is, and I'll make it worth your while. 20 bucks. Now, where is she? 20 bucks for the gas and oil. I ain't seen no woman. Great. Anybody ever tell you you talk too much? 20 bucks, I gotta get somewhere. WJ, watch the shop. I'll be back in a few minutes. Is there some kind of game to you?
Perry. Ken, I can barely hear you. Where are you? Porterville. Where's Arthur? He said he was going home. Why? Perry, listen. Lauren Kent was shot and killed this afternoon. The Porterville police did a complete ballistics test on the bullets they found, and they were definitely fired from the same gun that killed Alana Westbrook. I think Arthur killed them both. Ken, that just can't be so. Well, then where is he? It was his gun and his bullets, and he had a lot to gain getting Alana and Lauren out of the way. Perry, I just don't want you going out on a limb on this. Look, Ken, once I was your lawyer. I believed in you the way I believe in Arthur. Now do this for me, Ken. Ken, are you there? Yeah. Alana Westbrook was raised in Porterville. Find out where she lived, who remembers her when she was a child. Find out what relative she has there. Get back to me as soon as... Perry? Ken? Ken? your house until 11 last night. Where were you? I panicked. I got in the car and just drove. I must have driven a couple hundred miles. Something wrong? Yes. Lauren Kent is dead. All rise. The Denver County Court is now in session. Judge Eleanor Harrelson presiding. Be seated. You may call your first witness, Mr. Mason. Uh, may I have a moment, Your Honor? Very well. Lauren's dead. She was murdered. We're waiting for more news from Ken. Where is he? I'm not sure. What's he doing? I'm not sure of that either. Lauren betrayed you, Arthur. I just hope Ken found something to... Mr. Mason. Uh, Your Honor, some new evidence has been found. I'd like to recall Dr. William Shaw, but I'd also like to take a short time to go over this evidence. Court will be in recess 15 minutes. That short enough, Mr. Mason? I don't know why you're asking me these questions. I had no reason to kill Alana. You and Alana Westbrook developed the Ingenue formula together, is that right? To be honest, Alana dealt with marketing and public relations. I developed the formula. We started 20 years ago when we worked together in Europe. And Mrs. Westbrook used herself as a guinea pig for Ingenue under your guidance, is that true? Yes. How long had she used the formula, Doctor? I believe she had used an experimental version for quite some time. Dr. Shell. How old was Ilana Westbrook? I don't know. Now, I gave you two envelopes. Would you look into envelope number one, please? Now, that is the birth certificate Ilana Westbrook showed to the press to prove she was 62. Do you recognize it? Yes. Now, envelope number two, please. That is another birth certificate, one which was found in the house of a woman named Lauren Kent. To whom does it belong? Alana Westbrook. According to the birth date on that certificate, how old was Alana Westbrook when she died? Forty. How old? Forty. And Ingenue never changed her appearance, did it, Doctor? Her appearance was always miraculous, wasn't it? She was very beautiful, yes. And you... You were in love with her. Mr. Mason. 
Yes, I loved her. Dr. Schelm, if Alana was only 40 and the face cream had not changed her appearance, then the whole thing was a charade, almost fraudulent. No, it was not a fraud. The cream just wasn't ready yet. Alana said that she could no longer afford to wait for us. She was deeply in debt. So, Lauren Kent planted that counterfeit birth certificate and those false records. That was Lauren's idea and Alana's. They said it would take the public years to realize that Ingenue didn't work. I tried to stop them. You see, Mr. Mason, <laughs> the cream really was great. The formula was almost ready. Germany, Dr. Schelm, Germany. Isn't it true your father changed your family name when he and your mother moved out of Germany? Our name used to be Schellenberg. Your grandfather, Gustav Schellenberg, was a renowned marksman. He passed that skill on to your father, who then taught it to you, isn't that correct? As a matter of fact, you were a greater marksman than Arthur Westbrook. I was considered by some to be an expert marksman, yes. Your Honor, I'm momentarily through with this witness, but I reserve the right to recall him. I now call W.J. Cronkite to the stand. Mr. Cronkite, you were the one who helped Mr. Melansky find his way to Lauren Kent's house that first time, that correct? Yes. You also helped him find all the evidence he just brought into court. Yes, I did that, and uh, I sure hope it wasn't against the law. Oh, I think you're in the clear. Now, Mr. Cronkite, you also overheard a long-distance telephone call made by Lauren Kent at the Porterville gas station. Could you tell us about that? Well, I, I don't remember at all, but... Uh, she said she was going to make sure that Melansky followed her up some road in his car. And that he was going to be right behind her when she got there. Sure sounded like something bad was going to happen. You know who she was calling? No, I don't know that. But I remember the number. Uh, our phone's in terrible shape. It's kind of old. And she had to get a hold of the operator to get her call. I uh, jotted down the number. I, I got it right here. Uh, Your Honor, I'd like that telephone number introduced as Defense Exhibit D. Thank you, Mr. Cronkite. You've been very helpful. I now recall Dr. William Schell. Dr. Schell. Defense Exhibit D is a telephone number called by Lauren Kent from the Porterville service station. Now, that number, 303-555-4128, is your telephone number, is it not? Yes. So, it had to be you that directed Lauren Kent to drive up that mountain road, to be followed by Ken Melansky. Yes. Only you had the knowledge that they were on that road, and you are an excellent marksman, Dr. Shell. She betrayed you, both you and Alana. You couldn't let her get away with that, could you? Is that why you killed her? She deserved it. The woman you loved. Did she deserve to be killed? We were happy in Switzerland. I was in love with her. I would have done anything for her, anything. I created the formula for her. Ambitious. She was so ambitious. She left me, went to the United States, and married him. I was never the same, Mr. Mason. I was devastated. When she called, asked me to be her chief chemist. I couldn't say no. I could never say no. I couldn't say no to being with her. And then she stole the formula. 
I was never to see her again. Can you imagine? I would have given her anything. She didn't need to do that. I loved her. I still do. But you killed her. Mr. Mason? Yes, I did. I killed her. Your Honor? The people have no objection to a dismissal of all charges, Your Honor. So ordered. Bailiffs, place Dr. Shell under arrest. Court is adjourned. wasn't a very good person, was she? Maybe I'm not much better. You know, Pierre, you can't imagine what it means to me that you stuck by me. That's what old friends are for. Yeah. Old friends. Thank you. This is the fifth one in less than an hour. Reminds me of a day in the Columbia with my grandfather. Fish were jumping into the boat. Uh, you know, it's a shame Della hasn't caught anything yet. Last time she won the tournament, and today she can't even get a bite. We're just better fishermen. Don't you think so, Della? I think if you'd untie my hands, things would be different. No, oh, ma'am, we like things just the way they are. <laughs> Whoa, got another one. So do I. When we get back to shore, you're both doomed. Just toast this morning. Yes, ma'am. Wheat toast. I was watching the weather report this morning. It's gonna be a beautiful day, Miss Draper. Beautiful day. Yes, it certainly is. Just be a minute. Of course, these days no line would be complete without something for the working woman. Therefore, I created these. Very nice. I think we can do some business. Thank you. My things should do very well in your stores. Looks like what I've heard is true. What have you heard? But you're back from the dead. I prefer to think of it as having been on a creative sabbatical. Excuse me, Mr. Sabatini, somebody's here to see you. Take a closer look, I'll be right back. Hello, Marco. A buyer? With any luck. What can I do for you? Let's talk. In private?
Also, a microphone was pointed at you, Marco. Recorded every word you said. Do you want to hear the tape? No. Good. Because every time I hear it, I get very angry. What are you going to do? I am going to bury you two. You're going to print this? Next issue of Sweet 2000. Editor's column. You can't do that. Why not? Give me one good reason why I shouldn't tell everybody what a sorry piece of scum you are. I'll pay you. Anything you want. I have connections you can't believe. Keep those. I have copies. Oh, by the way, Marco, your new line looks fabulous. Too bad no one's going to want to touch it after I get through with you. I have bad news. Desk. Everyone's in the conference room. Here's your coffee. Good. And Tanya Sloan is inside waiting for you. She's what? I'm sorry, Miss Draper. I couldn't stop her. Lacey. She just came bodging in, saying that she absolutely had to talk to you and that she'd do something horrible if any of us tried to make her leave. Oh. So, Tanya, what is this horrible thing you're threatening to do? A scene from that play you bombed in last year? That's not funny. Interesting, that's exactly what the critics said. In fact, dear, shouldn't you be at an acting class or something? For your information, I fly to Los Angeles tomorrow to meet with Kevin. He wants me to co-star in his next picture. So, go home and pack. Not until I know if it's true. If what is true? I heard you're going to write about me in your next column. Should I, Tanya? Have you been a naughty girl? I have worked too hard to get where I am. I am not going to let you ruin me. Tanya, two sayings come to mind. You made your bed, now lie in it. And, if you can't take the heat, get out of the kitchen. And I do mean, get out. And here's one for you, Diane. What goes around, comes around. Bimbo. shot these? Kim Weatherly. Oh, they're very good. Must be all that practice he got in Newark. Okay, go with these three. Okay? All right. Let's look at the layout. Come on, come on. All right. This is cluttered, juvenile, unacceptable. Do it over. Diane, we go to press tomorrow. Not with that layout, we don't. Look, if I'm gone by the time you finish, bring that over to my apartment tonight. And if it's still not right, your next assignment will be to clean out your desk. Got it? All right, Julia, what's next? Uh, pages 95 through 97 are ads. Excuse ads. me. Mr. Aver, it's 1210 and you have a 1230 luncheon. <sighs> All right. Everybody back here at 2. Thank you, Gerard. Would you like a cocktail while you wait? Just the usual. Mineral water with a splash of lime juice. Very good. Seltzer with lime, table four. I'm sorry to keep you waiting. Your name? Mason. Perry Mason. Ah, it'll just be a moment, Mr. Mason. We're in luck. They're busy. That's good. Means they haven't changed chefs since the last time we were here. Uh. Lauren? Della Street, what a surprise. 
been trying to reach you. Perry, you remember Lauren Jeffries? Of course. Nice to see you again. <laughs> what are you doing in New York? Perry's receiving an award from the American Bar Association. Congratulations. Della deserves it just as much as I do. I can believe that. You know, I still think the woman behind the man story that we did on you was the best in the whole series. Oh. In fact, it's probably the best we've ever done, period. Come on. Listen, how is Metropolitan doing? Oh, it's doing great. It, the magazine practically runs itself these days. And then you could join us for lunch. Well, yes. actually, I have plans. I just dropped in oh. here and have work so. But I really do want to see you. How long are you going to be in town? Just till Friday. Well, call my office this afternoon. We'll figure out something. Okay. Oh, wonderful. I'd love it. Mr. Mason, this way, please. I'll be right with you, sir. It's only common courtesy to return a phone call. We have a deadline. I was too busy. May I sit down? I am waiting for someone. Then I'll keep you company. Thank you, Gerard. Very interesting. Diane Draper chatting with Lauren. Should I know who Diane Draper is? Only if you read the fashion magazines. She runs a magazine, Sweet 2000. It's Metropolitan's biggest competition. Very tough lady. Are she and Lauren competitors? More like uh, bitter rivals. Now, why in the hell would I want to waste my column on you? Because the way things are going, my magazine is going to overtake yours within a year, and you are desperate. Huh, you wish. Yeah, well, I know how you operate, Diane. I, I know how it turns you on to hurt people. All I do is sell magazines. Oh, yes. By digging through people's garbage and then tearing them to pieces in that column of yours every month. Look, all I do is tell it like it is. Not about me, you don't. What the hell is that? A threat? Morning. Have a nice day. Newark. Julie, what do, you, what do you mean she said something about Newark? She said something about you getting a lot of practice there. Did she say what she meant by that? No, it was not in her remark. She didn't mean anything by it. Is she in? No. Even if she was, she wouldn't want to talk to her. We publish tomorrow. Kim, these are great. I'll tell you what, as soon as Diane gets off the warpath, I'll pass them along, all right? You seen a column? For next month? No, she never writes until the very last minute. Who's she going after this time? Why do you ask? I got a feeling it's gonna be me. Oh, man, not you, too. I mean, every month it's the same thing. People who are just positive that Diane is gonna write something bad about them come crawling out of the woodwork begging her not to. I mean, half the time she's never even heard of them. Yeah, John's over. Come on, conference room. Let's go. Diane. Wait, wait, Kim, Kim, Kim. Uh, don't, all right? I'll talk to her. And if you come by my place for dinner tonight, I'll tell you what she said. Okay. Okay, it's 926 West 74th, apartment 219, let's say 730. Here are your messages. Who'd you like to call back first? Nobody. I'm going home and so are you. All right. See you in the morning. Good night, Lacey. Good night. Diane, can I talk to you? Tomorrow. I'm out of here. You written your column yet? That's why they invented home computers, Julia. Well, it's just that people have been bugging me all day about who you're going after this month. What are you telling them? That I don't know. <laughs> Good. Then people will be surprised. Yeah, what? There's somebody here to see you. Uh, 
assistant name is Lauren Jeffries. Send her up. You can go up. A pop in 4B. Thank you. Snow White herself. What a surprise. We're gonna have this out, Diane, once and for all. Yeah, I love it. Paris, my favorite city on earth. It's a city of light. Hmm? No, hmm. maybe I think it's the city of food. Yeah. <laughs> no, no doubt they can see it. No, it's just a clock. Wait, 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 wait. Hello? Yes, this is she. No, 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 that's no problem. Um, I'll be right there. I'm, I'm not too far. All right. All right, bye-bye. Julia, you're leaving. Yeah, look, I'm sorry, but uh, somebody was supposed to drop a layout off at of Diane's tonight, but she's not answering the phone or the door. The security guard's worried something may have happened to her. Um, I'm really sorry. Just, um... I won't be long. So why don't you just wait here, all right? Diane? Diane, it's Julie. Are you there? Trying to keep. It's really odd. She's just trying to make her laugh. What happened to her? Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Hurry. She's dead. We don't want any. Lauren Jeffries called while we were at the banquet. She's been arrested. Karna puts the time of death between 8 p.m. and 9 p.m. Not only did the security guard log Miss Jeffries into the building at 7.54, but the person living in the apartment next to the victim heard shouting and loud noises at around 8.20. That was five minutes before the security guard locked Miss Jeffries out of the building. But no one actually saw anything. We also found some of the victim's jewelry in the bottom drawer of Miss Jeffries' desk. Detective Brennan... Doesn't it seem a little strange to you that a woman who makes half a million dollars a year would stoop to robbery? Guess she was just in the mood. A floppy disk was stolen out of the victim's computer that night, too. Did you find that in Miss Jeffrey's desk? No. But the victim's secretary found what we're assuming was on that disk in the computer at the magazine the next morning. Apparently, Miss Draper had transmitted it via modem sometime before she was murdered. It was her column for the next editor's page, all about how Miss Jeffries had solicited vibes from fashion designers. She would give them favorable press, and they would give her money. Lauren Jeffries stole that disc and killed Diane Draper in an attempt to save her reputation. It's as simple as that. But this isn't true. None of this is true. But Diane was going to print it. I have never taken a bribe in my life. No one has ever paid for editorial space in my magazine. Why did you go to see her that night? For the same reason that I went to see her that day in the restaurant. I was number one on her hit list. She was determined to get me. I wanted to stop it. Because she was becoming a nuisance? She was calling people, trying to get dirt about me. That wasn't all. I knew that if Diane put her mind to it, she would eventually find some, some way to, to discredit me. I don't believe that. Well, we all have our secrets. Some we should know about? Yes. 
I have a daughter. I was 16. Back in Odessa, Texas in those days, when a girl got pregnant, she stayed pregnant. I, I wanted to give my baby up for adoption. But my boyfriend, Scott, wouldn't hear of it. So, two weeks after she was born, I, I left her at Scott's. I got on a bus to New York, and I never went back. You left your baby? I had to. I assumed that Scott's grandparents would take care of her. I found out later that they made him do it all by himself. Instead of going to college, he got a job at a rendering plant. He worked there until he was 38, at which time he died of what amounted to alcoholism. There's no reason for all of this to come out in court. There's more. My daughter managed to get out of Odessa. She came to New York and got a job at Sweet 2000 as Diane Draper's assistant. Her name is Julia Collier. Does she know you're her mother? Of course. She wanted to work for Diane to spite me. Did Diane know? Oh, yes. She loved to rub my nose in the fact that my only daughter hated me every chance she got. But it isn't the kind of thing that she would have put in a column, if that's what you're getting at. Why not? Well, because it was common knowledge. I mean, people in our business already knew. If she put it in her column, it would have been a, an embarrassment, but that's about all. When you went to her apartment that night, did she tell you her column was going to be about you? I couldn't get her to talk about anything, so I left. You weren't the one who took that disc from her computer? And I wasn't the one who killed her. I swear. Well? Well, what? You still haven't told me if you've decided to take her case. Stella, there are thousands of very good attorneys in this city who would jump at the chance to defend a woman who is not only innocent, but who can pay their fee without blinking an eye. Mm -hmm. But uh, you have something that they don't. What is that? Secretary, who will find it very hard to forgive you if you turn this case down. Della. Perry, she needs you. Della. Oh, Perry. Call Ken. I already have. What's that? Here you are. Tanya Sloan. Mm -hmm. The actress? Rumor has it she's going to co-star in a very big motion picture. Ah. And that she had an argument with Diane Draper the day of the murder. And they were going to talk about the column that Diane was writing. Because she only went after the rich and famous, right? Miss Sloan certainly fits that profile. Here you are. Kim Weatherly. And Marco Sabatini. Weatherly's the hottest fashion photographer in New York right now, and Sabatini's a very successful clothes designer. Kim was overheard expressing concern that Diane's next column was going to be about him. And Sabatini? Diane's driver said she dropped in to see him at his showroom on her way to work the morning of the murder. But if her column was going to be about one of these three and not Lauren Jeffries? How do you explain the column that was on the computer at the magazine? I'd say the killer dictated a phony column to her and forced her to send it before he killed her. Maybe he wrote the column himself and sent it after he killed her. Check with the phone company. It wouldn't hurt to know the precise time that document was transmitted. But why your client? Why'd the killer frame her? Lauren had a confrontation with Diane in a restaurant. Later that day, that confrontation was common knowledge among the people in the fashion industry, plus the fact that she and Diane were long-standing business rivals. It all made her the perfect patsy. Well, I guess I'll start with Tanya Sloan. No. Start with Sabatini.
Tanya's in L.A., but she'll be back Friday. Yeah, I'm looking for Mr. Sabatini. Oh, he's not here. He's not? No, I took the day off. Well, how come I just saw him walk in here? You didn't. My name's Ken Molansky. I'm an attorney. I work with Perry Mason. You might have heard of him. He's representing the woman who's accused of killing Diane Draper. I'd like to talk to Mr. Sabatini. Well, when I see him, I'll tell him. Well, you must have a good memory. Like an elephant. Did Diane always write her column at home? Not always, no. But she did it often enough that sending it to the computer at the office was no problem. Well, yeah, she worked at home and modem stuff in all the time. In other words, anybody could have used this computer to modem something to the office. What are you getting at? I think Lauren Jeffries was framed. By whom? Tanya Sloan, Marco Sabatini, or Kim Weatherly? Do you know any of them? Well, yes, I know all of them. They all apparently thought Diane was going to write about them in her next column. Look, Mr. Mason, Kim was with me when this happened. From 7.30 right up until the time I came over and found the body, we were having dinner at my place. And Diane kept her jewelry here? As far as I know, yeah. Well, thank you, Julia. I've seen enough for now. I've been meaning to ask you something. Let me guess, does it have something to do with the fact that Lauren Jeffries is my mother? You didn't need me to let you in here. You could have gotten a key from the police. She thinks you hate her. I do. Why? Why? Have you ever heard her side of what happened all those years ago, Julia? No, I really don't want to hear it. You should hear it. Mr. Mason, she murdered Diane. It wouldn't hurt to hear her side of that story either. After you. Sabatini. You are Marco Sabatini, right? Sabatini took the day off. I just want to ask you a few questions. You have the wrong person. You're going to have to talk to me sooner or later. Maybe never, counselor. Sayonara. Yo, taxi. Hey. Mr. Mason. Mr. Mason, hi. I'm Peter Whalen, assistant district attorney. I'll be prosecuting the Jeffries case. And you must be Della Street. Hi, I'm Peter Whalen. Nice to meet you. Thank you. I can't tell you what an honor this is, sir. Mr. Mason, I think you're the greatest. I've studied every single one of your cases. Every case? You're one of my idols. I begged for this assignment. I'm, um, I'm flattered. I've never looked forward to anything so much in my life. Well... I'm looking forward to trying this case, too. No, no, Mr. Mason. I'm talking about beating you. (laughs) 
<laughs> Your Honor, the defendant owns homes in London, Saint Tropez, New York, and Vail. Now she has bank accounts not only in those four cities, but in Bermuda and Switzerland as well. In other words, she could very easily flee this jurisdiction and take residence in any number of countries with no significant decline in her lifestyle whatsoever. In fact, Your Honor, the risk of flight is so great here that the state requests that bail be denied. Mr. Mason. Uh, Mr. Wyndham, if what mattered most to my client was being affluent and enjoying a certain lifestyle, Your Honor, she would have retired to any one of those geographical locations years ago. What matters most to her is her magazine. She created it, nurtured it, watched it grow and mature. It's what has kept her here all these years. And it's what will continue to keep her here long after these charges have proven false. I request that she be released on her own recognizance. The charge is murder, Mr. Mason. An OR release is out of the question. However, the court is not entirely unmoved by your eloquence. Bail is set at $250,000. Let's see, gentlemen, how does the 27th sound? Uh, that's fine, Your Honor. Prosecution concurs. Good. The court will adjourn for lunch. We will resume at 2 p.m. Thank God. I can't wait to get out of here. Lauren? I think that maybe it's time we talked. Oh. All right. Um, dinner tonight? All right, um, I'll call me when you get home. Can you believe that? Wonderful. Let's get out of here before she changes her mind. I'll see you at the hotel. I knew you'd go with the, uh, her magazine as her life argument. But, frankly, I couldn't think of a way to deprive you of it. Well, I'm sure you'll do better next time, Mr. Whalen. You bet I will. Oh, I almost forgot. I have something for you. Preliminary list of the people I'm going to call as witnesses. You can't be serious. I'll see you here in court, Counselor. Now. I may have to remove myself from this case. Why? The argument we overheard in that restaurant. Whalen plans to call me as a witness. Lauren, you don't understand. I want you to be my lawyer, and that's that. There's a very good chance I'll be called to testify against you. I don't care. I'd be in the position of helping the prosecution convict you. How can you help convict me when I'm innocent? Lauren, it's not as simple as that. Look, if you're telling me they won't allow you to be my attorney, that's one thing. But if you were asking me if I still want you to be my lawyer, I think I've made myself more than clear. Mandela.
Got it, got it. Terrific. You guys all right? Good, good. Tanya, you got about 20 minutes, okay? Good. All right, Gary, get Billy Ray down here. I want to hear, not on the phone. Miss Sloan? Very amazing. Ah, you made it. It's a lot of work for a commercial. Well, commercials these days are sometimes bigger than films. This one's for a new perfume called Purloin. I gather you have a few questions you'd like to ask me. Shall we talk in here? I understand you talked to Diane Draper the day she was murdered. Yes, I did. And that your conversation didn't last very long. No, didn't. May I ask what you talked about? I uh, heard that she was going to write about me in her column. Your drug problem? I do not have a drug problem. Diane thought you did. Yeah, well, she was wrong. Besides, she couldn't prove anything. Still, if there were a speculation about it... It could have ruined me. Look, I don't know why Diane had it in for me. Maybe she was jealous. <laughs> Who knows? Was she going to write about you in her column? Mr. Mason, at the time of the murder, I was at a play called Harley's House. It stank. But I told the writer I loved it because I was his guest and he still pulls some weight in Hollywood. Okay? Okay. Before today, I'd have thought it impossible for you to be in two places at once. But I can't say that anymore, can I? Hey, Marco's in? No, I haven't heard from him yet. Then who's that for? Somebody who's waiting for him, an old friend from out of town. A friend? Mm-hmm. Give me that. I'll take a hike. Until I talk to Sabatini. What for? You already been through his desk, haven't you? Now, what makes you think I'd do a thing like that? Get lost before I have you hold him for trespassing. Yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah. So I'm the ammo. Right. Exactly. Yeah. On Wednesday? Sounds wonderful. I think we can do that. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, he said I'd probably have better luck finding Marco at that place he usually hangs out at. Damn, I forgot the name already. Gabriella's? Gabriella's, yeah, that's it. Thanks a lot. You're welcome. suggested we go to dinner from here so I could see where you live. It's very nice. Oh, thank you. Of course, I've known for a long time where you live. I just never. Look, uh, maybe this is a bad idea. I don't know. You've got to let me explain. <laughs> you don't want to explain. No. You want to make excuses. I want to tell you what happened. No, I know what happened. You decided that you didn't want me. That's what happened. You didn't want me, so you just left me. I was 16 years old. I didn't know what I wanted. Well, all I know, lady, is that you didn't want me. You were better off without me. How, how dare you even say that to me? I mean, even kids whose mothers swore at them or hit them. I mean, I envied them. I mean, at least their mother hadn't taken one look at them and then just walked away. <laughs> Your father was ready for you, Julie. I just wasn't. I went away from you because I didn't know how else I was going to survive. I thought being with a father who was devoted to you would be enough. I didn't know how horribly it was going to hurt you. I'll tell you the truth. Even 
even if I had, I wouldn't have stayed. I couldn't. I'm sorry. So, uh, what do you propose we do now? I mean, are we supposed to start over? Is that it? Why don't we just start from here? I'll, um, I'll get my purse. Said you found Sabatini. Yeah, but look who he's with. How you doing, all right? Everybody all right, Dad? I know. Mr. Mob himself. What should we do now? What you came to do? I mean, I started the day chasing a dressmaker. Wait, Perry, wait. Excuse me, Marco Sabatini? Who are you? My name's Mason. I represent the woman accused of murdering Diane Draper. I'd like to ask you a few questions. Albert Nardone. And I have heard of you. And I have you. I've heard you know more about criminal law than I do. <laughs> what kind of questions do you want to ask my cousin, Mr. Mason? Your cousin? But he's the son of my cousin, but it's family. That's the important thing. I don't care what kind of questions he has. If he wants to talk to me, he does in front of my lawyer. And since my lawyer's not here, neither am I. Uh, I'm afraid he's stubborn like his mother. Mr. Mason, join me. Uh, rain check. Sure. You're getting to be a bad habit, you know that? License number. No, I didn't get the color of the car. Sabatini's bodyguard saw it. Who knows? He and Nardone split the minute the cops showed up. I think that's why Sabatini was afraid to talk to us. There's no guns involved. Possible. Well, that's it. That's it. about several thousand cars. Yeah, but the car we're looking for has a broken headlight. Whoever was driving it may have stolen. That's true. Not much of a lead, is it? You better tell the police and head back to the hotel. I want you to get a good night's sleep. Oh, uh, Ken. It's a lead. Hey, Lieutenant. Give you a lift? Oh, thanks, I can take a cab. <laughs> Come on, why pay for a cab when you can ride in this nice limo for free? Because I don't want to take a ride in a nice limo for free. I got something right here, says you do. So 
I wanted to talk to her. So what? You also tried to call her that day four times. I repeat, so what? So what was that important? I just turned in some proof sheets. I want to know what she thought. It had nothing to do with those pictures you used to take in Newark? You lost me. Before you became a fashion photographer, you paid the bills by taking pictures for a businessman in Newark. A man who has since been jailed for the sale and distribution of pornography. Who told you that? It came from notes found in Diane Draper's office. If she'd put that in her column, it would have been disastrous for you, wouldn't it? People in this town tend to be very open-minded. Not your present publishers. Look, I don't even know why we're having this conversation. I was with somebody the night Diane was killed. I have an alibi. I was with a friend. Maybe you also you have friends who would agree to do okay. you a favor. Here you go. I got him on the line. Hello, Mr. Mason. No. You're going to have to excuse me. Uh, when I went to pay for breakfast this morning, I discovered I was missing a credit card. Yeah, I'd like to report a missing card. This uh, business, a pleasure. Well, actually, it's a little bit of both. The magazine's doing the shoot, so I came over to supervise, and I really like to watch Kim work. Your dinner with your mother went well, I hear. Yes. Anyway. But we still have a long way to go. But you're talking. Yeah. Would you excuse me for a minute, please? right, Ken Melansky. Well, you, me, Tony over here, Mason, we all want the same thing. We do? Yeah, we do. Marco was my relative. Not a close relative, but a relative nonetheless. You want to know who killed him? I want to know who killed him. Well, if you want to know the truth, we sort of thought that you might have had him killed. <laughs> that goes to show you how much you know. Tell me something, Mr. Melansky. Uh, what do you think? The teal or the periwinkle? Excuse me? Which material? For the dress? Never mind, never mind. The teal. Teal. Two years ago, Marco came to me on his knees. He just learned uh, the hard way that he lacked the one thing it takes to be a good clothes designer. Talent. So I told him I'd give him enough money to get on his feet on one condition. That he let me design the dresses. He could have all the credit. He agreed, and the rest is history. You design dresses? I love doing this. I'm very good at it. But in my profession, one has to maintain a certain image, so I keep it a secret. Oh, yeah. But whoever killed Marco killed my partner, as well as my cousin, and I want to find out who that was. Marco killed Diane Draper? No, no, no. He said he didn't, and I have to assume he knew better than to lie to me. And what were you two talking about last night? Well, she knew something about him, something bad. And uh, he was worried that someone like Mason would say it gave him a motive for killing her, so he was asking my advice. What was it she knew about him? He didn't tell me, and I didn't ask. But I want to know who killed Marco, Mr. Malansky. And since I am a little disappointed in Tony over here for letting this all happen right under his nose, 
that Tony's going to make up for it by helping you find the killer. Isn't that right, Tony? Yes, sir. Oh, now, now, wait a second. Take them both back to the hotel. Hey, hey I don't work for you. You can't do this. Hey, hey, look. All right, all right, hold on. What is this? It's a subpoena. It ensures your presence at this hearing. I may need you to testify. Testify? What's to testify? I told you I had nothing to do with Diane's murder, and I have no idea who did. The writer you went to the play with said you went outside to have a cigarette during the first intermission and didn't return until the third act. Oh, so I had several cigarettes. Like I told you, the play stank. Make yourself comfortable, Miss Sloan. Lieutenant! Where did you find this jar? It was lying a few feet from the victim's body. Because of the presence of blood and tissue, it was believed to be the murder weapon. In fact, Your Honor, this jar has been stipulated by counsel to be the murder weapon. And did you then have the jar examined for fingerprints? Yes, sir. And for purposes of probable cause only, what was discovered? A fingerprint matching the defendant's right thumb was identified. And what did you do next? Search warrants for the defendant's office, home, and car were executed. And what was found? A gold necklace and bracelet belonging to the decedent were discovered in a desk drawer in the defendant's office. Thank you, Lieutenant. Mr. Whalen, may I? Thank you. Now, Lieutenant Brennan, did you find the defendant's fingerprints anywhere else on this candy jar? We found prints from her left hand up near the top. If a woman were to pick up a heavy jar like this to look at it, would you expect her to use one hand or two? Two. Like this. Right hand on the base, left hand near the top. Possibly. Did you find the defendant's fingerprints anywhere else in Miss Draper's apartment? They were all over the place. Door jam, desk, chair. And were they all over the victim's jewelry as well? We didn't find any prints on the jewelry. Not even the victims? The stuff had been wiped clean. Don't you think it's strange, Lieutenant, that the defendant would wipe all her fingerprints from that jewelry? Jewelry she then put into her own desk, and after doing that, not bother to remove a single print of hers from the scene of the murder? Objection. Relevancy. Mr. Mason is commencing his argument. Sustained. Withdrawn. Nothing further. You want to look through our files? Uh, we believe one of your cars was recently involved in a hit-and-run accident during which one of its headlights was broken. What we'd really like to do is take a look at your damage reports. Sorry. You can't see a thing without a court order. Yeah, well, court orders take a lot of time, and we don't have a lot of time. Corporate policy is very strict on such matters, okay? You want to go through our files, you got to have a court order or an okay from the senior vice president. So call the senior vice president. Oh, in your dreams. Look, if you don't help us Ken, out, Ken, the wrong Ken, please. Could I have a sec? Let me introduce myself. My name is Tony Loomis. I am a dear, dear friend of Mr. Nardone. Are you aware who Mr. Nardone is? Thank you. Uh, I'll just go talk to the senior vice president on your behalf right now. Yeah, uh, please, have a seat. Yeah, can okay, I get you anything? You want Diet Cola? Nah, we're fine. Yeah, no, I'm fine. What did you say to him? I just made sure he understood how important it was for us to find that car. Chris Collier. <clears throat> How long have you been a decedent's executive assistant? About uh, three and a half years. And your job entailed what? I made sure that whatever she wanted done got done. Would you say that it entailed working closely with her? Yes, 
Very closely, uh, ten hours a day, sometimes six days a week. So you knew her well? Yes, very well. And as someone who knew her very well, how would you characterize the relationship between her and the defendant, Lauren Jeffers? Were they friends? No. Enemies? Competitors. Simply stated, there was bad blood between them, was there not? Yes. Didn't they have a violent argument which you witnessed last year? Yes. And isn't it true that to your knowledge, they didn't talk to each other for over a year until the defendant barged into a New York restaurant last week and verbally attacked Ms. Draper? That's true, <clears throat> yes. What is your relationship to the defendant, Ms. Collier? Uh, she, she, she's my mother. And even you, Lauren Jeffrey's own daughter, can't deny the fact that the defendant was violently angry with Diane Draper, can you? No, Thank I... Thank you, nothing further. Thank you. Don't cross-examine her. Lauren, I can't let this stand. Perry, please. Mr. Mason. A moment to confer with my client, Your Honor. Perry, let it stand, please. I don't want her embarrassed. It's difficult already as it is. Cross, Mr. Mason. No questions, Your Honor. Witness may step down. Your Honor, for his next witness, the state calls Perry Mason. I understand that you witnessed a confrontation between the decedent and Ms. Jeffries at the La Mistral restaurant last month. I saw them discussing something. I'm not sure confrontation is the right word. The discussion was loud, wasn't it? I couldn't make out what they were saying, so no, I wouldn't say it was particularly loud. Would you say that we're more agitated? Animated is the word I'd use. Mr. Mason, could you see their expressions? Yes. Well, would you say the women looked calm or angry? I'd say they looked earnest. You didn't answer my question. Your question was badly phrased. You're being deliberately evasive, aren't you? I'm answering your questions as best I can. You're playing semantic games with me, Mr. I'm Mason. I'm doing no such thing. And in doing thing. so, you're depriving this court of the truth. I am Gentlemen. being a responsible How can you witness? behave like Gentlemen. this, counselor? A man of your reputation. Gentlemen. Uh, my reputation has nothing to do with it. Gentlemen, please, stop this at once. We just had an argument, didn't we? Yes. One that was every bit as acrimonious as the one Miss Jeffries and the decedent had in that restaurant. Isn't that correct, Mr. Mason? What we had, Mr. Whalen, was just a difference of opinion between two professionals. Intense, perhaps, but I still like you, Mr. Whalen. Just because two people have an argument doesn't mean they harbor ill feelings toward each other. Doesn't mean they're going to go to war. I have no further questions. You may step down, Mr. Mason. That's it, they're jerking us around. This guy's history and so is his boss. Oh, sit down, don't you ever get tired of talking like a two-bit hood? Hey, the way I talk gets results, and that's what life's about, college boy getting results, so just shut your face and let me handle this. Uh, sorry to keep you waiting. Uh, gentlemen, this is Deborah Richards, Senior Vice President of Triborough Auto Rental. Hi. Uh, Gerald here told me you want to go through our damage reports. I'm afraid that's out of the question. Wait, listen, ma'am. I'm sorry. Corporate policy forbids it. I'd like to help you, but I just can't. No, no, no. Obviously, you Tony, don't... Tony, Miss Richards, could we talk privately for a moment? Uh, you have to excuse my friend. Sometimes he gets a little temperamental. You know, I was thinking... <laughs> huh. 
All right. The garage is 10 blocks up at 1420. I'll have someone meet you there. Thanks. We really appreciate it. You coming? What'd you say to her? Oh, I just told her how important it was that we find that car. Results, Tony. That's what life's about. Okay, if it'll make you stop pouting, I asked if we'd go down to the lot and take a look at the cars that were returned to them damaged. Here you go. That's all you said? That's all I said. You don't always have to be a bully to get results, Tony. Get out of my face. I think somebody gave you a call about us? Yeah, you're the guys who want to see the cars. We've got scheduled for shop work. That's us. Well, here they are. Wow. All these cars, huh? Yep. These and seven more floors. She said something like, I'm going to have it out with you for once and for all, Diane. Then they went inside. And after you got back from walking your dog, what happened? Well, I was in the living room reading when I heard Diane yelling at someone next door. I couldn't make out exactly what she was saying, but she sounded furious. <laughs> then I heard a thump. Thump. And then a bump. A bump. And after that, nothing. Hmm. Any idea what time that was? 8.20. I remember looking at the clock. 8.20. 8.20. According to the security guard's testimony, that was a good five minutes before the defendant was seen leaving the building. Thank you. You're welcome. Is uh, that all? That's all. Ms. Wilson, are you married? My husband died six years ago. Oh, I'm sorry. Any children? Just my daughter, Shannon. And she's how old? Fifteen. Was she home that night? No, she was out with friends. On a school night? I told her to be home by 10 o'clock, and she was. I notice you're not wearing a watch. Ever wear one? No. I have very sensitive skin. <laughs> watch bands give me a rash. <laughs> I'm sorry. Do you uh, watch a lot of TV? Oh, I hardly watch any. My daughter does, but I'd rather read. So when you're home by yourself, as you were that night, the only way for you to know what time it is, is to look at a clock. Well, yes. Thank you. I have no more questions. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. <laughs> Witness may step down. Oh, thank you, Your Honor. The state rests its case, Your Honor. Very well. Is the defense ready to proceed? Yes, it is. Uh, Defense calls Shannon Wilson to the stand. Miss Wilson, what time did you get home the night Diane Draper was murdered? Ten o'clock. Are you sure it was ten? Yeah, just ask my mom. The thing is, when I ask the security guard who keeps a record of everyone who enters and leaves the building, he said you got home at 10.30. He did? Wow, it, um, he must have made a mistake. Shannon, isn't it true that before you went out that night, you set all the clocks in your mother's apartment back so you could spend an extra half hour with your boyfriend? Isn't that true? And isn't it true that you reset all the clocks before your mother got up the next morning so she'd never know what you'd done? I wouldn't do something like that to my mother. Shannon, this lady could be your mother. And this lady is on trial for murder. Now, it's very, very important that you tell the truth. All right, I, I set the clocks back a half an hour. I'm sorry. So... When you got home that night, it was really 10.30, not 10 o'clock. 
which means when your mother heard those sounds coming from next door, it was really 8.50, not 8.20, which means the murder occurred some 25 minutes after the defendant was seen leaving the building. Thank you, Shannon. Nothing further. Mr. Whalen? No questions. Witness may step down. Here you go, my man. Thank you. He's on his way. He's on his way. You'll see. Hey, you want something? I'll have this. Yeah, make that too. Grazie. Well, here you go. Thanks a lot. Still can't believe we went through 793 cars and still couldn't find the one we were looking for. That's because the guy who whacked Marco just hasn't turned it in yet. That's all. Now you know. Educated guess. The guy figured people ask fewer questions if he turned it in after he got the headlights fixed. I mean, that's what I would do. Yeah, I guess that's what I'd do too. Just wait right here. Just out of curiosity, how'd you end up working for a guy like Albert Nardone? I was born in the Bronx. Went to grammar school at St. John Vianney. Went to high school St. Helena's. Got to know some people who knew some people. How'd you wind up being a yuppie lawyer? Born in Providence, St. Wenceslas Grammar School, Casimir Pulaski High School. College and law school in Denver. Denver? Ah. Did my graduate work in Brooklyn, the Knights of St. Paul. That's where I learned to shoot pool. <laughs> I learned to shoot pool at the National Polish Alliance then. Polish Center? You any good? No, I just play for fun. Ah, oh, yuppie lawyer hustle. I love it. Got to play you sometime, see how good you are. Yeah, sure, sometime. Yo, Rocket, you got here quick, just like I asked. I like that. Hey. Tell them what we're looking for. You mean the car? Of course I mean the car. All right, uh, according to what the mechanic at Triborough said about this year's fleet, it's a 91 Ford Taurus, brown. Yeah. Broken right headlight, possible dent in the hood, possible dent in the right front fender. Yeah. Got that? Got it. So get going. Come on, get out of here. What the hell was that about? You'll see. Come on. Come on. Yeah, all right, all right. Come to order. All rise. Department 79 is now in session. The Honorable Renee Trayball presiding. Be seated. Mr. Mason, I believe that you were about to call your next witness. Your Honor, may we approach? Your Honor, a witness has come forward whose testimony is extremely relevant to this case. The state moves to reopen his case in chief so that she may be called without delay. Now, in anticipation of defense counsel's objections, I can cite at least three cases where similar motions were granted. I have no objections, Mr. Whalen. You don't? No, I don't. Oh. In fact, you can put her on the stand right now. Really? Really. I just ask that when you're through, I be granted a recess so I can prepare a competent cross-examination. Mr. Whalen? Great. Very well. Granted. Mrs. Cooper. How are you? Good. How's the neighborhood? Nice. Good. I understand the window of your kitchen affords you an unobstructed view of the entrance to the garage of the decedent's apartment building. Is that correct? That's right, huh? Please tell the court what you saw the night Diane Draper was murdered. Well, when I went in the kitchen around a quarter to nine to get a snack, I noticed someone standing outside on the sidewalk by the garage like they were waiting for someone. I didn't think anything of it, of course. But on my way out of the kitchen, I saw that a car had just come out of the garage, and as the door started coming down after it, this lady all of a sudden ducks underneath it and goes inside. You saw her enter the apartment building via the garage? That's right, uh-huh. What makes you so sure it was a quarter till nine? I was watching TV. My favorite sitcoms were on that night. I got up during the commercial, so it must have been about a quarter to. Is the person you saw that night here in this courtroom today? Uh-huh. That's her over there. Let the record show that the witness pointed without hesitation to the defendant, Lauren Jeffries.
Mrs. Cooper, I'm glad your health is good. I'm glad your neighborhood is nice. Now, why did it take you so long to come forward? Because I didn't realize what I saw that night was important until I saw her picture in the paper a couple of days ago. You're absolutely certain the defendant is the person you saw into the garage that night? Absolutely, uh-huh. Your Honor, at this time, I'd like to conduct the brief experiment we discussed in chambers. Again, I object. Again, you're overruled. In view of the situation, I believe that Mr. Mason is more than entitled to a little leeway. Bayless, proceed, Mr. Mason. Thank you, Your Honor. Now, Ms. Cooper, would you say the distance from where you are sitting to the back of the courtroom is greater or less than the distance from your kitchen window to the sidewalk outside the garage? Less than, definitely. And would you say there is more light <clears throat> at the back of the courtroom than there was on the sidewalk that night, or less light? More. Once again, Ms. Cooper, would you point to the person you saw duck into the garage of the decedent's apartment building the night of the murder? The second one from the right, that, sir. The second from the right. Let the record show that the witness did not point to the defendant, but I do think I know why you thought you were pointing to her, Mrs. Cooper. Now, Ms. Cooper, I handed you a newspaper when you took the stand. Would you please open it to the front page? Now, that's the newspaper article and picture you mentioned you saw a couple of days ago, was it not? Yes. The person you just pointed to is wearing the exact same thing Ms. Jeffries was wearing in that photo. That's why you assumed she was Lauren Jeffries, is it not? From what you saw in that paper? Yes, I guess so. Thank you, Ms. Jeffries. Now, are you absolutely certain it was Lauren Jeffries you saw enter the garage that night? No, I guess not. Thank you, Ms. Cooper. No further questions. This place does the best work in the city. Got cars booked for repairs clear into next month. The one you're looking for? Yeah, I think this is it. This has got to be it. Nice work. Here, give me that. Rocket, you're a genius, huh? Hey, Tony. Go buy yourself a slide rule or something. Come on. Get out of here. Of course. It's fantastic. It's great to have a friend in the auto industry. He's in the car business? My buddy can strip a car faster than you could write up some legal paper. Huh? Is the rental agreement in there? Yeah, here it is. Your name on it? Yep. JFK, make it fast. Hi, Kim. My name's Ken Melansky. I work with Perry Mason. This is my friend Tony Loomis. Could we talk to you for a second? Hey. Forget about JFK. Hey, come on. I got to get there. Where are you going so fast? I'm on assignment. Not anymore. We found the car you used to kill Marco Sabatini. What, what are you talking about? This is a copy of the rental agreement. Your credit card, your signature. I didn't sign this. I lost my credit card weeks ago. I don't know what you're yeah, talking you're about. My boss will want to talk to you anyway. So come hey, on. This is where you and I park company. What the hell are you doing? What's going on? Hey, Cam, you see what I got here? Come on, yes, Tony. Sir. You, you can't, can't do this. You can't do Get out. Come on, man. Get out of here. Hey, taxi! What can I do for you? I'm here to see Mr. Nardone. And your name? That's not important. What's well, important to me? I'll tell you what's important. I'm here to consult with Mr. Nardone on some new fabrics. Evidently, he doesn't like his periwinkle. Well, I don't know. You don't know? Look, I'm on a tight schedule. 
You'll just have to tell Mr. Nardone. I'll see him sometime next week. Hey, hey, okay, okay, just wait a minute. The dart. Hey, hey, come back here. He's coming with me. I'm sorry, Mr. Nardone. All right, all right, all right. Don't worry about it, all right, Mr. Malansky? As far as you're concerned, he took a cab to the airport. He was never seen again. I said he's coming with me. Come on, can you us? What's the difference? He's gonna get what he deserves. We don't right? know what he deserves, Tony. He killed my cousin. You don't know that for sure, just like we don't know for sure he killed Diane Draper, and nobody will know anything for sure if you kill him. Escort Mr. Malansky back to town. Will you please? Yeah. Go on, get him! Hey. I said I escort him, not rough him, huh? I'm not leaving here without him. You're pushing your luck, college boy. Let, let him go, let him go. Tony. You better know what you're doing. Because I can always settle the score with him. And you, later. Come on. Let him go. All right, Tony. Where were we? You had reason to believe the decedent knew about your involvement in pornography, did you not? Yes. You were worried she was going to expose you in her next column, is that not correct? Yes. Which is why you went to her apartment that night. I never went to her apartment that night. You tried to talk her out of writing about you, and when that failed, you killed her. I couldn't have killed her. I was with someone that night. Julia called you? Yes. Call her up here, ask her. You were at her place? Yes. When did you get there? 7.30. And when did you leave? When she did, around 10. You were in her apartment the whole time from 7.30 till 10? Yes. Did you have dinner while you were there? Yes. What did you eat, do you recall? We had Chinese. <laughs> Where did the Chinese food come from? You went out and picked it up, did you not? You were gone from Ms. Collier's apartment from 8.30 to 9.15, is that correct? It wasn't that long. The building where Diane Draper lived is only eight blocks from Julia Collier's and only three blocks from the Chinese takeout, is that not correct? Wait a minute. You had 45 minutes. It would have been no problem at all for you to walk from Julia's to Diane's to the takeout and back again. Is that not correct? I didn't do that, I swear. Of course you didn't. Mr. Whalen. No questions, Your Honor. Witnesses excused. Court will reconvene at 10 tomorrow morning. All rise. Congratulations. Looks like things are really looking out for him. Huh? They are now. Considering what just happened here, I can finally go back to Los Angeles. I'm afraid it's not over yet. Keep this opinion. The judge said that you could leave. Perry, so we can't actually prove that Kim Weatherly did it. Let's face it, we don't have to. After today's testimony, there's certainly a reasonable doubt that Warren killed Diane Draper. All right, you tell me. What is the judge going to do? I don't want to move for a dismissal until we have this case nailed down. Well, I've been through Kim's file a thousand times. We don't have any more on him. Maybe the answer isn't Kim. Kim isn't the killer? The killer typed a column which implicated Lauren, sent it to the computer at the magazine, stole, 
and probably destroyed the disc which contained the original column. Now, is that correct? So? Remember the Cold War? We discovered we could tell what the Russians were up to because they accused us of doing whatever it was they were doing. You think the killer wrote a column accusing Lauren of taking bribes because he was taking bribes? He or she, yes. It's an interesting theory. You know, this may sound silly, but I heard that Diane had a very big fight with Pietro Arnati, and she swore she'd never advertise or wear his line again. Is that right, Lauren? As far as I know. Look at these photos. When she was murdered, she was wearing an Arnati scarf. Was she wearing that scarf when you went to see her that night? I really don't remember. Well, try. I'm sorry. I don't remember. It's late. I'll uh, see you all tomorrow. Thank you very much. Good night, Lauren. Perry? Something's wrong. Very wrong. Remain seated. Come to order. Department 79 is now in session. The Honorable Renee Trayball presiding. Mr. Mason. Um, defense recalls Julia Collier to the stand. What are you doing? I think you know. Perry, no. She's my daughter. After 25 years, we're finally together. Please don't do this. You, uh, you knew Pietro Arnati, did you not? Yes. You also knew Marco Sabatini? Yes. Would you tell the court, please, who he was? He was a clothing designer based here in New York. Mr. Sabatini was recently killed in a hit-and-run car accident, was he not? Yes. Miss Collier, my associate, Mr. Milansky, is showing you bank records, which we will mark Defense Exhibit D. Those records show your deposits for the past year. You recognize them? Yes, these are my records. Now, he is also showing you bank records, which we will mark Defense Exhibit E. Those records contain all of the withdrawals from the account of Marco Sabatini for the past year. Now, would you explain why it is that in four separate instances, when Mr. Sabatini withdrew certain sums from his account, you deposited the exact same sums to your account? I don't know, coincidence? Four times in the past year, clothes designed by Mr. Sabatini received extremely favorable coverage in the magazine you work for. So? So, wasn't Mr. Sabatini paying you in exchange for rave reviews? I wasn't the one taking bribes, Mr. Mason. Who was? Diane thought it was my mother. You mean according to Diane's column written the night of the murder? Yes. We discovered yesterday that Mr. Weatherly is unable to fully account for his whereabouts on the night of the murder, which means your whereabouts that night are not fully verified. Well, I was at home waiting for Kim to return. Do you always send the people you invite for dinner out to get their own Chinese? Well, no, but, but by the time I got home that night, I was too tired to cook. I mean, Kim was very understanding. You invited Kim over so he, he could give you some semblance of an alibi, did you not? I have no idea what you're talking about. I'm talking about the phone call Marco Sabatini made to you after Diane left his showroom that morning. You now have a copy of his phone records in front of you. He told you Diane had found out about the bribes you'd been taking. He told you she planned to expose the two of you in her column. So you invited Kim over? sent him out for Chinese food, then left the apartment shortly after he did and went over to Diane. No, I did not. You went through her garage and went up to her apartment. You tried to talk her out of exposing you. When she refused, you 
You simply killed her. No, no. Then you sat down at her computer and transmitted a column that you had written, that you had written, which accused Lauren Jeffries of crimes you had committed. You transmitted that column to the computer at the magazine so she'd be blamed for the murder. No. Then you left, taking with you the computer disc containing Diane's column and jewelry. Jewelry you later planted at your mother's office to further implicate her. You also removed other evidence that proved you'd been taking bribes. Nothing that you're saying is true, all right? Nothing. Oh, it is true, Ms. Collier. It is true. So is the fact that you stole Kim Weatherly's credit card when he returned to your apartment that night. No! You stole his card and used it a few days later to rent a car. A car you then used to kill the one person who was still a threat to you. That person was Marco Sabatini. You know, you can't prove any of this. None of it. Oh, but I can, Miss Collier. I can prove all of it. Mr. Williger, please stand. I can call this young man as a witness. He waited on you at the agency where you rented the car. Now, Mr. Johansson, would you please stand? Mr. Molensky. Mr. Johansson is the mechanic who waited on you at the repair shop where you took the car to get fixed after the hit and run. We can call him as a witness, or we can enter that scarf into evidence as defense exhibit F. That scarf was found near Diane when you and the others found her dead. Was she wearing it when she was killed? No, Ms. Collier. She was not. You were wearing it. When you killed her, you got blood all over it. Blood all over it. You threw it near her, hoping people would think it was hers. Now, you did that, did you not? No, I did not do that. I mean, yes, the scarf is mine, but Diane borrowed it from me. No. I... It's a Pietro Arnotti scarf. A scarf she would never wear. <laughs> Oh, well, you, you must be very happy now, hmm? It's time you'll be rid of me for good, won't you? Your mother suspected you all along. Diane told her about you and Marco, but she said nothing to me, nothing. She always tried to protect you, always. Yet you were willing to shut her away for life. Why? Because I hate her. I hated her when I was five. I hated her when I was 25. And I hate her now. In view of these developments, Your Honor, I move that the case against my client be dismissed. Prosecution concurs. So moved. Case dismissed. Bailiff, see to it that Ms. Collier is properly attended to. This court is now adjourned. All rise. Just an act. Wasn't it? Mr. Mason, I look forward to the next time. Well, for what it's worth, this time wasn't easy. Wasn't?
How old are you, Mr. Whalen? I'm uh, 29. Why? I wish I'd been as competent as you when I was your age. Thank you. Can I buy you dinner tonight? Oh, give me a rain check, will you? Uh, no, I have a better idea. The next time we oppose each other and you win, I'll buy you dinner. Thank you. Hmm. Think. Hey, Mr. Molaski. Your boss does uh, nice work. Oh, thanks. I'll pass that along. Mr. Molanski, you saved me from making a big mistake. Uh, I owe you. Oh, no, you don't. Yes, I do. Hey, there's got to be something Mr. Nardone could do for you. Oh, Ken. How very thoughtful of you. Oh. It's lovely. Gangster original, huh? What's wrong? Oh, uh, Ken, it's it's so sweet of you, but and, and it's a gorgeous dress, but it's just not my style. Oh, sure it is. No, Ken, I I won't have you spending a lot of money for something that I'll never wear. I want you to return it. Return it. Well, that's no problem, is it? life in the service of others. He was a confidant of presidents and kings, but he never forgot who he was and where he was from. He worked tirelessly for the people of this state. He will not be forgotten. Senator Hyland's sudden death marks not only the end of 27 years in the Senate, but also of a political era. The question now is who will serve out the remaining three years in his term. Governor O'Neill is not scheduled to announce his appointment until sometime next week, but sources say that at the head of his list are Congressman William Harding, State Representative James Marshall, and Laura Robertson. Laura, listen, everybody. Listen, a toast to Laura. May she go from senior partner in our firm to junior senator. Oh, Here. Yeah. 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 When do you think you'll be meeting with the governor, Laura? Actually, I already have. Laura, I don't really think you should. Oh, darling, we're all old friends here. <laughs> if anybody should be the first to know, they should. I met with Ted privately two days ago. I got the appointment. <laughs> uh, folks, folks, out of respect for the late senator, the governor isn't going to announce this until next week. So please, until then, say nothing to anyone. Laura, terrific news. Now, don't you go taking my name off the office letterhead just yet, okay, Elliot? Nothing's going to go wrong, darling. <laughs> she may practice corporate law, but she lives Murphy's. Yes, sir. Glenn, phone call. Excuse me. I'm very happy for you, for all of us, Audrey. Laura, congratulations. 
Washington is precisely the kind of place where a woman of your class should be. Thank you, Emmett. Hello. Mr. Robinson, you want to see your wife make it to the Senate? Of course. Well, then you and me better meet. Do you know where the Ridge Bar is? Who are you? Just somebody that has some information for sale. Information about what? You know, um, a son, a Sunland, Arizona. Why don't you meet me at the Ridge Bar in an hour? Hello. Hello. Glenn? some escrow papers to sign or my new shopping center development may fall through oh couldn't it wait till morning it won't take long <clears throat> mr robinson <laughs> please, please sit down. I saw you on TV today. Oh, you look great. Uh, me, I never go to funerals. Depressing. <laughs> what the hell is this all about? Well, uh... You know, being a senator is a uh, high-pressure, high-visibility job. Now, me, I say, so what? Your wife spent time in a mental hospital. <laughs> Most politicians probably should, right? <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. You're right. You showed up here because you're thirsty. Sit down. This is what I'm talking about. It pretty well details the nervous breakdown your wife had seven years ago. It's all here. Everything they did to treat her, the drugs, psychotherapy, shock treatments. Now, I have an open mind about this sort of thing. I say if it works, use it. But most people, most people are very old fashioned about the mental stability of their representatives. How'd you find out? I wouldn't worry about that. And you won't have to worry about it either. Once you give me $50,000. 50000 Cash. There's a phone in front of your bank. I'll call you there at exactly 11 o'clock tomorrow and tell you what to do with the money. What if I can't get it? <laughs> then I have to give this to the person that hired me. And by 11 o'clock tomorrow night, Laura Robinson will be the lead news story on every show in the state. And I guarantee you it won't be because she was appointed to the Senate. You have a good day. I nearly called the police. I wasn't sneaking about. I just didn't want to wake you up. Where have you been? Bill and I had to drive out to see the property owners. Got late, so we stopped for dinner. I'm sorry that I worried you, darling. You missed a great party. Are you all right? Oh, yeah. A little tired, maybe. Nothing that a little time in bed couldn't cure. Sounds good to me. Glenn! 
It's good to see you again. Well, hello, Arthur. Uh, I was on my way to your office. We've sure got our fingers crossed around here. What? Laura's appointment to the Senate. Oh, yes, yes, of course. I need some cash, Arthur. Certainly. And how much you want? $50,000. Yes, and I need it in a hurry. Well, I'm sorry, but I've got to get the president to approve waiving the notice period for a withdrawal this large. He's not going to be in till 1. All right. I'll be back by 1.30. And I want my money waiting for me. Got the money? Not yet, but I will. I'll get it. You damn well better. Uh, how do I look? Well, I'd say gorgeous. No, no, no. Fantastic. <laughs> how do I look? Nervous. Nervous? Well, I'm not nervous. Relax, darling. You've been to these fundraisers before. But never with a beautiful U.S. senator on my arm. Will the governor be there? At $500 a plate, you'd better believe it. It won't be long before they start paying to see you. I'll <laughs> get that. You get your coat. Hello. You got the money? Yes, I've got it. You know where the Pioneer Motel is? I'll find it. All right. Now, this is what I want you to do. I want you to bring me the money to room three at exactly 10.30. Do you understand? 10.30. Right. Right. Ready, darling? Oh, tell them I'll be glad to talk to them in my office, but not here. Will do. You're on your own. Where are you going? I want to say hello to Walt. I'll be right back. Harry. As always. So do you. Beard's old. Kane's new. I was skiing yesterday. What are you doing here? I'm at the hotel for the weekend. Trial lawyer's seminar. Still practicing law? On occasion. I'm here to lecture. Not me, I hope. Am I intruding? You certainly are. Laura, this is Michael Reston. He's representing the prosecution in the seminar. How do you do? Hello. If you'll excuse us. Can I take you away from all this? Hotel bar, 10 minutes. Very attractive. Very. You know her well? You might say so, yes. Excuse me. It wasn't so easy getting away. You remembered. A gimlet with fresh lime. Yes, I remember. Hmm. It's been quite a while. Hmm. Who's counting? How are you, Mary? Fine. And you, Senator? Oh, that's a bit premature. The smart money says you're the one. Who would have thought, when we were younger, that I would become a senator and you'd become, well, Perry Mason? 
or that we see each other rarely. I've missed you. The governor's looking for you. You remember Perry? Of course. Perry. Hello, Glenn. I'll be right there. Yeah. Anybody here? It's not locked, Della. Perry. I've no right to come to you, but I don't know what else to do. Here, sit down. Can I get you something? What's wrong? Yesterday, somebody called my husband and said that he had a, a file of information that could ruin me. He wanted... $50,000. So Glenn took the money to the Pioneer Motel at 10.30. Only when he got there, the blackmailer was dead and the file was gone. What did Glenn do? What anybody would have done. He ran. He came back to the fundraiser and told me everything. What was in the file? Oh, clinical records from seven years ago. My depression. I, I couldn't work, and people were told that I'd gone away on an extended vacation. But you went away to be treated? To the Halvan Clinic in Arizona. I was home within six weeks, and I felt fine ever since. The problem is, 
The therapy included uh, shock treatment. Proof of that was in the file? Glenn knew what would happen if the media got hold of that file. My political career would be ruined. But now, what should we do? Well, first, Glenn has to go to the police. He has to make a report. But he'd have to tell them everything. Where's Glenn now? At home. Laura, I can only advise you that two of you will have to decide what to do. We're investigating the death of Luke Dixon at... Laura, where have you been? Out getting help. Who's this? Police. Sergeant Austin, Metro Division. What have you told her? Nothing. What is Perry doing here? He thought he could help. Did he? As I was saying, a man was killed tonight in what appears to have been a fight at the Pioneer Motel. The desk clerk says you were there tonight, Mr. Robertson. He said he recognized you from the news. What is it you want, Sergeant? I just want to ask Mr. Robertson a few questions, preferably downtown. My client has nothing to say. All right. Thanks for your cooperation. I uh, didn't know that we'd hired you as my attorney. You needed one just then. We're very lucky to have him. Did you tell him everything? I had to. Perhaps the two of you should discuss this privately. No, that's not necessary. She's right. I'm grateful you're here. I'm going upstairs. Good night, Glenn. Good night. Good night. Perry. That's the Dixon file. I was just taking it to Laura. It's my file, Audrey. I can manage. Thanks, just the same. Here's the headlines on our victim. His name was Luke Dixon. The police said he was a small-time nickel and dime private eye. Said the guy spent most of his time tailing philandering spouses and drinking whatever was cheap. How could he have gotten hold of those files? And more important than that, where the hell are they now? You can be sure they'll surface. Glenn, we should go to the police, tell them the truth. How do we know they'll believe me? The thing is, if you don't come forward now, nobody's ever likely to believe you. Terry's right. Hold on, let's not rush it. We've got to think things through here. If we handle this right, maybe do some damage control. A little stage managing, you just might be able to survive this. It seems to me our main concern should be Glenn's future, not politics. That goes without saying. You misunderstood me. We mustn't throw Laura's career to the wolves. Mrs. Robertson, the police are here. Show them in. Hello again, Sergeant. We got a tip early this morning telling us Luke Dixon was blackmailing someone and that if we wanted to find out who, we should check out the Halvern Clinic in Sunland, Arizona. So we did. We were told that some records were recently stolen. Your records, Mrs. Robertson. And the thief's fingerprints matched Luke Dixon's. Are you the person he was blackmailing? That's quite an accusation, Sergeant. Considering you have nothing to support it. Wondering where you lost your cigarette case, Mr. Robertson? You know, the gold one with your initials on the front? How about the Pioneer Motel, room three, not six feet from Luke Dixon's body? You're under arrest, Mr. Robertson. Your Honor, in the interest of time and to assist the prosecution, defendant waives further reading of the indictment and advisement of constitutional rights and wishes to proceed directly to the matter of bail. The record shall so reflect the defendant's waivers. On the issue of bail, does the state wish to be heard? Yes, Your Honor. The defendant is an extremely wealthy man. 
Not only does he own a home here, he also maintains an apartment in the city of New York and a house just outside Zurich, Switzerland. This indicates not only that he has few real roots here, it also suggests that fleeing the jurisdiction of this court is well within his means. Therefore, to ensure the defendant's appearance in this court, the state urges that bail be denied. Your Honor, Mr. Robertson is a well-rooted, successful member of the community who has never been accused of a crime and who is determined to appear here in court until his innocence has been proven. I urge the court to release Mr. Robertson on his own recognizance. Mr. Mason, I think some bail is appropriate here. Um, bail is set in the amount of $200,000. Preliminary hearing is set on December 10th. Is that acceptable to the defense? It is, Your Honor. Mr. Reston? Prosecution agrees. Next case, bailiff. State versus Sinclair. I certainly didn't expect to see you here. I thought you would have gone home by now. Well, in view of Mrs. Robertson's political prominence, the district attorney felt that this case warranted a special prosecutor. I'm delighted. Oh? Yes. When Glenn Robertson is found innocent, no one can say it was because of politics, right? Right? Right. Has the governor at all been brought into this? Seven years ago, I became ill, something that currently afflicts close to 10 million Americans. I went away, got some treatment and some rest, and came home cured. It was my husband's devotion to me, his fear that this somehow might be misconstrued or blown out of proportion, that landed him in this unfortunate situation. Given the circumstances, I can well understand why the governor would be reluctant to appoint me to the Senate. Frankly, that's no longer important. My job now is to do everything possible to make sure the truth is told and my husband is exonerated of all charges. That's all I'm concerned with. Nothing else matters. About the Over this way. One more second. What's the matter, Counselor? Who's your client? When did you get him? About an hour ago. The hotel said I could find you here. Let's get to work. He's in a great mood. The police discovered Laura's file had been stolen, found Glenn's cigarette case near Dixon's body, and took him in. Any ideas? Only what I've already told you. So Dixon got greedy, tried his hand at a little blackmail instead of turning the file over. Then you think the person that hired Dixon to steal the records is the person that killed him? Sounds good. Paul, here's his office address. See if you can find out who his last employer was. You did say you've been here before. Oh, I used to date somebody who lives up here. Broke up with her about three years ago. Not a happy ending. Let her down kind of hard. Hoping to see her again. Tell her it's a big city. The odds against that are astronomical. Besides, I checked the phone book. She's now listed. Just bear in mind, both of you, the murder was, one way or another, the result of an attempt to discredit Laura. When we unravel that, we'll get to the killer. Thanks. How is Laura? She's a trooper. Always has been. Uh, but by the way, Perry, I've been meaning to ask you, we didn't happen to go to the fundraiser because we knew she was going to be there, did we? What are we saying? 35 years isn't so long ago. It was 30 years ago. Who's counting? Not me. Talk to you later. Excuse me, my name is Mason. Name, address, license plate, business phone, and a major credit card, please. I would just like the key to room three. You know the cop? Defense attorney, here's my card. Blitz, blitz, get rid of it. It's Mr. Lane, isn't it? 
Sorry. Thank you. Quite a game. Right. Clipping? Oh, give me a break. Those referees will do with you every time. I want you to tell me and show me exactly what happened last night. You want me to go through it again? You're going to have to trust me sometime, Glenn. Look, I'll level with you. I don't like this arrangement. All right, Glenn. I'll level with you. There's nothing between Laura and me except friendship. Everything else ended a long time ago. I, uh, I walked through the door. It was open. The room was dark. Curtains open or drawn? Drawn. I bumped into the desk coming in. Knocked the phone to the floor. I picked it up, placed it back on the desk. Then I saw him lying there. Then what? I walked towards him. I put on a light and then moved a carafe or something so that I could feel his pulse. He was dead. And I started looking for the envelope that had the file in it. I tore through the dresser and I headed back to the desk and I tripped on something right there. Everything fell out of my jacket pocket. And that's how the cigarette case got there. And when you were picking things up, you saw the envelope? Yes, it, it was behind the dresser. A piece of it was sticking out, and I walked towards it, picked it up, looked for it. It was empty. I left. Did you see anyone in the parking lot or around the office? Not just the fellow at the desk. Look around and think hard. What else about last night comes to mind? Nothing. I could have told you this trip would be a waste of time. Waste of time? Not at all. Sorry. Is there something I can do for you? Well, that depends. On what? Who you are. Pete Sutton. I'm Luke Dixon's partner. Who are you? Paul Drake. I didn't know he had a partner. I got another surprise for you. Luke, he took a cab. He's dead. Vinny. I know. I'm investigating his murder. Cop? I work for a defense attorney. Wants to know who hired Dixon to dig up Laura Robertson's past. Uh, well, don't look at me. I'm trying to see if uh, Luke squirreled away some money. Get my half before his ex-wife grabs it. You don't spend much time in the office, do you? Why do you say that? You're tan. You spend a serious amount of time in the sun, don't you? Hey, that's very good. Hey, you're a trained observer. It's all right. I do a lot of surveillance. I'm the outside man. You must have an idea who some of his recent clients were. Oh, sorry. You know, you have to ask Luke. That is, if you don't mind waiting a very long time for an answer. <laughs> Didn't keep any records? Uh, well, of course he did. Man was obsessive. Uh, help yourself. In here? No, in the closet. I mean, where else? Here, I'll, uh, 
I'll even unlock the door for you. It's unlocked. Ah. Got a report that somebody broke in here. Looks like you're under arrest, friend. Hello, Della. Hello. I think Perry's expecting me. Yes, he is. Sit down, won't you? Can I get you anything? No, thanks, sir. Is Perry here? Oh, he'll be back any minute. Laura. I'm very sorry for what's happened. Thank you. We'll survive somehow. I've always admired you for your strength. Oh, I'm a professional survivor, Della. It's what I do. What about you? How have you been? Fine. Just fine. Steadfast and loyal, as always. That's what I do. Ever marry? No. I've always wanted to ask you, but never had the nerve and the bad manners at the same time. What about you and Perry? I mean... <laughs> All right. Perry and I have... Good. I see you two are getting reacquainted. Right. Laura, it was nice seeing you. If you'll excuse me, I have to go out for a while. Uh, where? Oh, I'm going to buy some supplies. You just bought supplies. Right. Well, I'll just go return a few phone calls. Am I interrupting something? No. No? Bye, Laura. Laura, you said seven years ago when you had your breakdown, people were told you'd gone away on vacation. Who knew what really happened? Let's see, uh, Emmett, of course. Emmett Michaels, you remember him. Still your doctor? Oh, he's still a good friend. Who else? Uh, my law partner, Elliot Moore. He could see for himself that something was terribly wrong. The same went for Jennifer Parker. She not only stuck with me, she's such a determined young woman. Sometimes I think she willed me back to health. And, of course, my assistant, Audrey Pratt. Besides Glenn, that's all. You're certain of that? Yes. I'm going to need all the information you can give me on those four people. Why? Because one of them could have hired Dixon to steal your medical records in order to ruin your career. And one of them could have killed Dixon when he tried to blackmail you on his own. Oh, Perry, you're wrong. Those are my friends. It's entirely possible that one of them is not a friend at all. Excuse me, Perry, Paul's on the phone. He sounds strange. Excuse me. Um, I ran out of change or I'd use the machine down the hall. Do you think it's possible I could have a cup of coffee? Sure. What? Please. And who do you work for? Lieutenant McNabb. Lieutenant McNabb. I'm a uh, PI working on the Robertson case. Oh, that's nice. I haven't had an opportunity to meet the officer in charge yet, but they're usually very defensive about a PI on a case. But I have nothing against cops. They do the best they can. 
You're free to go, Paul. Hello, Sergeant. Mr. Mason. Sergeant. Come on, Don Juan. Oh, do the best you can. The guy searching Dixon's office did the breaking and entering, not me. Any idea who he was? Definitely not his partner, and probably not Pete Sutton either. At least I couldn't find a Pete Sutton in the phone book. I'd like to know what he was doing in that office. I wouldn't believe how much that looked like Linda. Who's Linda? The girl I used to date here. I'm sorry, what were you saying? I said, I'd like to know what he was doing in that office. Oh, my pleasure. Matter of fact, I'll, I'll get on that right now. Oh, Paul. I really don't need any more clients. Just watch yourself. stopper, aren't you? Okay, so I'm sorry, you know? I saw those cops coming and I freaked. You're not Dixon's partner. You're not a P.I. You want to tell me who you are? My name's Wheeler. Sid Wheeler. Big Sid Wheeler. So, Sid, you break into Dixon's office. Now you break into his house. What is this, a chronic condition with you? Breaking and entering? I'm a desperate man, Paul. Dixon had something that I must find. Like what? Pictures. Pictures. That's my wife. I thought she was stepping out on me, so I hired Dixon to follow her. Turns out I was right. And he got pictures in color. Boy, did he get pictures. Didn't he turn them over to you? Hey, gave me a couple of samples. Said he'd keep the rest until I paid my fee. Which he suddenly doubled, that little creep. What makes you think they're here? Uh, maybe they're not. They gotta be someplace. They weren't at the office. I don't know. It's just a just a process of elimination. He didn't take them with him, that's for sure. <laughs> well, big Sid, I gotta go. But good luck. Thanks. Oh, well, by the way. The guy your wife was running around with. Friend of yours? Who said it was a guy? Huh. Huh. chance to say hello at the arraignment. What can I do for you? I need some answers. Anything to help? I understand Laura was under your care at the time of her breakdown seven years ago. Yes. What was your diagnosis? Well, in general, she was acutely depressed. So much so that she simply could no longer function. Now, whether chemical imbalances were a cause of the depression or a result of it, nevertheless, they were there. 
Once they were brought back into balance via the proper treatment, she was cured. I understand you were instrumental in keeping this episode a secret. <sighs> well, I, I led certain people to believe one or two things that weren't quite true concerning her health, yes. Where were you when Luke Dixon was murdered? You surely don't think that I... I had to ask. You don't have to answer. At home. Probably reading. Undoubtedly alone. You should have married, Emmett. You'd have had a better alibi. Keep me posted. Right. According to my contacts at the Capitol, the mail's been running seven to one in favor of Laura's appointment to the Senate. In spite of what's happened. Or maybe even because of it, who knows? Anyway, the best news is the governor's decided to delay the appointment until this thing's resolved. Proving once again that America loves a devoted wife. And making it imperative that we give them both barrels at this preliminary hearing. Because the way I see it, if we can get this case dismissed without a jury trial, we might actually be better off than we were to begin with. Of course, it's really all up to you, Perry. What kind of progress are you making? You seem quite determined that Laura gets that appointment. I am. It's a chance of a lifetime. For you? Or for her? <laughs> for both. I'm not gonna lie. I joined up with Laura seven years ago because I figured she could help get me where I really wanted to go. And that's to Washington. There's nothing wrong with that. It's natural. You scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. Symbiosis. Only game in town. Who do you think will get the appointment if she doesn't? I don't think. I know. Or at least my sources at the Capitol do. Bill Harding, no doubt about it. Which means he'd have to vacate his congressional seat. Obviously. I understand you keep a residence in that congressional district. That's right. But you don't live there. No, I don't. But that's your legal residence. Yes. So if Harding's congressional seat is vacated, you could run for office. It's called hedging your bets. Yes, indeed. You have a phone call. Uh, Sergeant Austin calling on behalf of a Mr. Drake. Mason. Maybe I should open a branch office down here. Oh, it's not going to happen again. Especially if I get my hands on that guy. Still have no idea who he is? Well, he's not a Pete Sutton, and he's not a Sid Wheeler either. I checked the license number. The plates were stolen. You're dealing with a pro. Yeah, well, so is he. Linda! For a second there, I thought... Good thing that wasn't her. You forgot to hide. You know what? I've been thinking. It's been three years. She wouldn't carry a grudge that long, would she? 
You implied she was devastated when you left her. Yeah, but it's been three years. That's practically a lifetime, isn't it? Mr. Mason. Uh, thanks for coming down here to meet me. I appreciate your taking the time to talk to me, Mr. Moore. I'm sure you're very busy. Yes, well, first things first. How can I help you? I understand you've been with the firm for some time. 26 years. Tom Robertson, that's Glenn's father, founded the firm. I was one of the first people he brought aboard. So you worked your way to the top. Tom made me a senior partner 12 years ago, uh, three years before he died. How long has Laura been a senior partner? Just about the same time, 12 years. She also worked her way to the top? <laughs> she married the boss's son. You mean she was given a full partnership the day she walked in the door? Close to it, yes. How do you feel about that, Mr. Moore? I don't harbor any resentment towards Laura, if that's what you're getting at, and I rather suspect it is. The truth is, she's a damn good lawyer. I understand she ran for Congress nine years ago, unsuccessfully. We all worked very hard in that campaign. I also understand you're the sole owner of the LLD Corporation. Yes. Why? That corporation made quite a few campaign contributions in that election. All of them perfectly legal. All of them went to support Laura's opponent. Very helpful, Mr. Moore. Thank you. So what you're hearing now is Pete Sutton or Sid Wheeler or whatever he's calling himself these days trashing the guy's house after I left. You think he was looking for the key? Well, there were six keys in this case when I saw it in Dixon's office. It's only five now. Do yeah, I need to talk to Batman? Hey, it's me. What's the morning line on a Bronco game? Well, get your money, all right? How's noon tomorrow? Yeah, I'll be there. Gambler? My theory is he got that tan of his at the racetrack. Huh. A bookie named Batman. <laughs> well, I'll see you. Where are you going? See if I can track down this Batman. <laughs> well, you certainly have me convinced that whoever killed Dixon had prior knowledge of Laura's breakdown. How many people knew? Four, to be exact. And each of them with a motive. Della, there were a lot of photographers at the fundraiser. See if you can round up some pictures. I'd like to know exactly who was there and when. All right. Mr. Mason, what do you think your chances are of winning this case? I'll let you know when we win. Mr. Robertson, just how far would you go to protect your wife? I've never even socked a reporter. Mrs. Robertson, what do you think your chances are of winning the Senate seat? As I've said before, my only concern is to prove my husband's innocence. Excuse us. Look, I'd like to help you, but I'm due in court. Just tell me where I can find Batman. Come again? You know, this guy calls himself Batman. He's a bookie. Where can I find him? Try Gotham City. Sergeant Austin, think of me as a lowly P.I. groveling in the dirt for tiny bits of information. And then think of yourself in this exalted position at the police department with access to all kinds of information. Couldn't you, out of the goodness of your heart, throw me some small, tiny tidbit? Hmm? 
You need help. That's the point. All right, try Mitchum's Bar and Grill. Thank you. Sure. You have a very nice smile. Sergeant Austin, did the medical examiner arrive at a cause of death? Yes, sir, he did. Please tell the court his finding. A deep wound at the temple indicated the decedent fell and hit his head on the corner of the dresser, causing his death. Were there any signs in the room of a prior struggle? It appeared the decedent had been struck on the head with a blunt object. Do you recognize this carafe marked People's Exhibit 3? Yes, I do. It has my tag on it. How does it come to have your tag on it? It was found on the floor approximately 38 inches to the left of the victim. Would that be the victim's left or the onlooker's left? Uh, the victim's left. So, here. That's correct. It has been stipulated by counsel that People's Exhibit 3 was in fact the so-called blunt object used to strike the victim. Were fingerprints found on this carafe? Yes, the defendants. I show you now People's Exhibit 9 and ask you to identify it. This is the customized cigarette case which was found on the floor of the victim's motel room, directly beneath the front window. Directly beneath the front window would be here. That's right. Were you able to identify the owner of the cigarette case? Yes, sir. It has the initials GR on the front, and we traced it to Mitchell's Sterling shop here in town. Your Honor, we offer as Exhibit 10 this sales receipt issued to Glenn Robertson by Mitchell Sterling, reflecting the sale of one cigarette case engraved with the initials GR on the front. Mr. Mason? No objection. Thank you. Sergeant Austin, in the course of your investigation, did you discover anything else, anything else, that could link the defendant, Glenn Robertson, to the victim, Luke Dixon? Yes, sir. The morning after the murder, we received an anonymous phone call telling us Luke Dixon was a blackmailer. Acting on the caller's information, we contacted the Halvern Clinic in Sunland, Arizona, and learned that records detailing the hospitalization and treatment of Laura Robertson had recently been stolen. Did you discover who stole those records? Fingerprints found at the scene of the burglary at the Halvern Clinic match those of the deceased Luke Dixon. Thank you, Sergeant Austin. No further questions? Your witness? Sergeant Austin, other than on the carafe, where else in that motel room were Glenn Robertson's fingerprints found? They were all over the room. On the chest of drawers? Yes. Desk? Yes. The phone? Yes. Were anyone else's fingerprints found on the phone? No, just his. Doesn't that strike you as rather unusual? No. No? A motel room phone gets a good deal of use. Yet, on that particular phone, only one set of fingerprints were found. Now, what does that suggest to you? That somebody cleaned it. A maid? Or someone else? Someone who was in that room ahead of Glenn Robertson, someone who wiped the phone clean to make sure no one would know who the killer was. Objection, Your Honor. Calls for speculation on the part of the witness. Sustained. Let's go back to the murder weapon, Sergeant. How many sets of prints were on the carafe? Just one. Dixon's? No, Glenn Robertson's. Then it, too, had been wiped clean? Objection, speculation. Sorry, Your Honor, no further questions. You may step down. Mr. Reston, you may call your next witness. Thank you, Your Honor. The people call Mr. Robert Lane to the stand. Were you working at the Pioneer Motel the evening that Luke Dixon was killed, Mr. Lane? I sure was. On that evening at around 10.30, did you see anyone arrive at the motel? Yes. That person right there. Let the record show that the witness has identified the defendant, Glenn Robertson, as the person he saw that night at the motel. Did you happen to notice where he went, Mr. Lane? To room three. Room three. You're certain? From the front desk, I have a clear view of everything. 
And I've got a hell of a memory. That being the case, uh, Mr. Lane, did you see anyone else go into room three that evening? No, sir. And I was right there at the front desk from 8 o'clock on. No one else went near that room. Thank you. Your witness. Mr. Lane, on the night of the murder, your shift at the motel began at 8 in the evening and ended at 8 in the morning, did it not? Yes, it did. 12 hours. How do you usually pass the time? Watch TV. Sometimes read. Is it possible someone could slip by you unseen while you're engrossed in one of these activities? I can see things out of the corner of my eye that most people can't see looking straight on. My boss will tell you. He did. He also said you're quite a football fan. Oh, you better believe it. I never miss a Bronco game. I understand the game they played recently against the 49ers was pretty exciting. Oh, yeah. Especially the last quarter. Oh? Why was that? Your Honor, I object. What possible relevance can a discussion of a football game have to this case? I intend to show relevance, Your Honor. I beg the court to bear with me just a moment or two longer. Very well. Proceed. What happened in the last quarter of that game, Mr. Lane? I'm sure you remember. Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, scores tied with two minutes to go. 49ers have the ball on their own 48. Montana drops back, it's a draw play, bam, stop the line of scrimmage, no gain. Second down, Montana takes a snap, drops back again, Broncos rush, crowd's going berserk. Uh, Montana hits a screen pass, bam, out of bounds on our 44. It's third and short, they rush, we hold, out comes the field goal unit from the 50, bam, from the 50-yard line, he hits it, 49ers are up by three. Your Honor, quickly, Mr. Lane, tell us about the last minute. Okay. There's 32 seconds to go. 49ers have the ball again on our 46. It's second and seven, and they're killing the clock. Fans are heading for the exits. TV announcers thanking all his engineers. Montana runs a simple off-tackle rush. Bam, there's a fumble. It's a huge pileup. One by one, the referee pulls off the players. There's a Bronco at the bottom. Bam, Bronco's ball. And Mr. John Elway leads his team out onto the field. It's first and 10, 27 seconds to go. Bam, Elway hits a down and out on their 48. Stops the clock with 22 seconds to go. Second and four, Elway takes the snap. Drops back, two 49ers bust through. Elway scrambles. Bam, he hits a fly pattern on the 20. There's one 49er between our guy and the game. Their guy dies, our guy cuts. Bam, TD Broncos win. It was awesome. I remind the spectators this is a courtroom, not a nightclub. Any further disturbances and I will have this courtroom cleared. Yes, Mr. Lane, it certainly was awesome. You uh, watched the game on TV? Uh, most of it, yes. At work? Uh, yes, I think I was at work. Do you recall what night that was, Mr. Lane? I can't write off, no. It was the night of September 12th, the night of the murder. Isn't it true, Mr. Lane, that from the moment you arrived at work, you were watching the game? Well, yes. Isn't it true the game ended at 10.30? And it was at that time you saw Glenn Robertson arrive at the motel? Yes. Isn't it also true any number of people could have gotten into that room without your seeing them while you were watching the game? Yes, I suppose so, but... Thank you, Mr. Lane. No further questions. You may step down. Call your next witness. Your Honor, the prosecution rests. Court will recess until 2.30 this afternoon.
It's me, Pete Dixon. Uh, meet me at the Crestmore Savings Alone at 4 o'clock this afternoon. We'll wrap things up. No, but I will. Right. That call have anything to do with the Robertson case? I think we should talk, Mr. Dixon. You by any chance Luke Dixon's brother? Oh, it wasn't by chance. My parents, they worked hard to have me. Now, this is the side. I may never forgive you. Drake. Should I be flattered? If you like being compared to a bad cold, unpleasant, hard to get rid of. No, no. If you don't have anything nice to say, don't say anything at all. What's in there? Ooh. New money. Uh-huh. Real name is Pete Dixon, as in Luke Dixon. You ever heard of him? If you want a rap sheet on him, check with records. I wonder what this is doing in here. Not on here. The safe deposit key is from Crestmore Savings and Loan. Well, Dixon's supposed to meet someone there at 4 o'clock. Do you mind if I... Uh, sorry. I think you're done here. I think you're right. Thank you. Sure. I won't forget this. Here are the photos I've come up with so far from the fundraiser. Let me see them. There isn't time. Perry, what do you want them for? Well, I don't know yet. I checked out Pete Dixon. He's done time for forgery, fraud, and grand theft auto. He must have had some angle on this case, knew who Luke Dixon was working for. Thought perhaps he could get some money out of it. How is he? He's still unconscious. We could keep that appointment for him, unless he comes to. Tell us who he was going to meet. Thank you. Bad news? That's a good question. All rise. Court is reconvened. Be seated. Mr. Mason, you may call your first witness. I call Dr. Emmett Michaels to the stand. Dr. Michaels, you were Laura Robertson's doctor at the time of her breakdown seven years ago. Is that correct? Yes. Now, exactly, exactly what was her condition? Well, she was suffering from a psychosis known as manic depression. In layman's terms, uh, she was on an emotional roller coaster over which she had no control. Fortunately, as most cases nowadays, she responded well and quickly to the treatment. Your treatment? <laughs> yes, my treatment. And what did your treatment consist of, Dr. Michaels? Well, mostly just regular doses of an antidepressant, uh, trimipramine, I believe. And shock treatment? Yes, it was uh, some electroconvulsive therapy, yes. That therapy is very controversial, is it not? And wasn't it controversial seven years ago as well? It was effective seven years ago. And the diagnosis I had made in Laura's case warranted it. I don't suppose you could give us the name of a medical authority who concurs with your diagnosis. Yes, I could. Dr. Arlington agrees with me. Who is Dr. Arlington? He's a psychiatrist, Mr. Mason. Probably one of the most famous England ever produced. We're not above a little edification, doctor. Tell us more. Ten years ago, he published a, a book called Arlington on Manic Depressives. Is Arlington on Manic Depressives considered definitive? 
Yes, it's the definitive book on the subject. And in that book, he agrees with your diagnosis. Completely. Thank you. Could you show us where Dr. Arlington agrees with you? I beg your pardon. That is a copy of Arlington on manic depressives, identical to the one I saw in your office. Please show the court where in that book Dr. Arlington agrees with you. Now. Yes, now. Show us, please. Well, I can't. I can't do that now, as you can see. That's a very thick book. I, I don't want to take up the court's time at searching through them. Don't you even know where approximately in the book he agrees with you? Well, I'm, I'm not sure. I, I would have to go through the whole book. I don't think that we have time for that now. Dr. Michaels, in order to hear the truth, I'm sure this court will give you all the time in the world. Your Honor, I object. Dr. Michaels is not on trial here. Your Honor, the prosecution is basing its whole case against my client on the idea that the murder of which he stands accused was the result of a blackmailing scheme. None of this is relevant. A scheme only a handful of people, the people who knew about Laura Robertson's medical history, could have orchestrated. I submit that the prosecution has left me no choice but to pursue this line of questioning. Objection overruled. The court is still waiting for you to show us where in that book Dr. Arlington agrees with you. have been in love with Laura Robertson? I suppose so. Yes. Isn't it true you were despondent when she married Glenn Robertson? Yes. Isn't it true that you diagnosed her condition as emotional instability to keep her dependent on you? No. Isn't it true that you subjected her to unnecessary shock treatment because you were afraid you were losing your influence over her? No. Isn't it true you knew if this treatment ever became public, it would ruin her career? I prescribed it because it was uh, consistent with my diagnosis. A diagnosis based on your need to manipulate and control the woman you couldn't have. Oh, Dr. Michaels. How could you say you love her? You don't even know the meaning of the word. No further questions. You may step down. This court will adjourn until 9 a.m. tomorrow. All right. shows up to keep that meeting Pete Dixon arranged as the blackmail. Linda. Paul? Linda. Paul! Linda! It's Paul! 
How are you? Great. Fat. How are you? I'm fine. It's a nice looking baby you got there. The one down here, I mean. <laughs> Thanks. Well, you look like you're doing okay. I am. I'm doing pretty good myself. I'm in town on business for a few days. I gotta go. Doctor's appointment. You take care. Nice to see you. I guess she managed to get over me. I guess she did. There's her guy. If you're waiting for Pete Dixon, he's not coming, Mr. Moore. What are you talking about? You paid his brother a lot of money to steal Laura Robertson's medical file. I did no such thing. Why were you going to expose Laura's medical history? You can answer in court if necessary. Well, Laura just waltzed into a job that I worked a lifetime to get. I was determined to stop this appointment. That's why I hired Luke, but he crossed me up. So you killed him? No, no. I never stepped foot in that motel room. Where were you the night of the murder? At a testimonial dinner. Mr. Moore, it would have been very easy to slip out during the after-dinner speech and slip back in again unnoticed. Yes. But how easy is it when you're sitting on a dais, Mr. Basin, giving the after-dinner speech with a hundred witnesses? Here's a list of your phone messages and your notes from today. And you still haven't looked at the photos from the fundraiser. Thank you, Della. How's your leg? Medium rare. It hurts. Take your medicine. If you need anything, I'll be in my room. Della? Mm hmm Thank you. Now I Night. Ninety-two of the Denver District Superior Court is now open and ready for the transaction of business. The Honorable Eleanor Daniels presiding. Be seated. Defense may proceed. Your Honor, defense calls Audrey Pratt to the stand. And you've been Mrs. Robertson's executive assistant for how long, Mrs. Pratt? Almost a year. But you worked with her prior to that. Yes, for nine years. Were you working for her September 12th, the day of the big fundraiser? Of course. Did she get many phone calls that day? Well, yes. People were calling left and right to congratulate her on her possible appointment to the Senate. Did you keep a record of those calls? I always write down the name of the caller, the time of the call, and whether or not Mrs. Robertson takes the call. I'd like you to think back, if you would, Mrs. Pratt. Do any of the calls that came in that day stand out in your mind? Well, 
I do remember receiving a call that day that was a bit unusual. In what way? The caller refused to give me his name. I remember arguing with him. He, he said he just had to speak with Mrs. Robertson, but he wouldn't tell me who he was. What finally happened? I put him through. Mrs. Robertson spoke with him. Briefly, as I recall, no more than two minutes. Were you present at the fundraiser that was held that night? You know I was, Mr. Mason. Well, that's right. We spoke about it several days ago, didn't we? I think you said Laura Robertson was never out of your sight except for the time she spent with me. That's right. Mrs. Pratt, I've known you for a long time. You've always been an honest and forthright person. Thank you. I'm sure that you wouldn't knowingly commit perjury while under oath, would you? Of course not. Did Mrs. Robertson leave the hotel at any time that evening? I don't know. Perhaps. What time did she leave? She left at 9.45. She told me that she was going to have a private meeting with some backers and that I should cover for her. But she didn't come back, did she? At least not right away. No. Do you remember what time she returned? Around 10.30. Thank you, Mrs. Pratt. That'll be all. I call Laura Robertson. Mrs. Robertson, as you know, you cannot be forced to testify against your husband. Yes, I know. I show you this photograph, Mrs. Robertson, and ask if you can identify it and tell us when and where it was taken. Well, that's my associate, Jennifer Parker, and me. It was taken at the fundraiser on the evening of September 12th. Was the photograph taken before you left the party? I don't know. This is a blow-up of part of that photograph. Could you tell the court what you see? Jennifer's wearing a watch. It says 9.20. Uh, that was before I left the party. The man who called you at the office that afternoon but refused to leave his name, who was he? Just a well-wisher, I suppose. I don't remember. Was it the blackmailer, Luke Dixon? No. Wasn't he calling to make sure your husband would deliver the money? Now, think carefully before you answer. The answer is no. You're certain. Objection, asked and answered. Please, Laura. Don't make this more difficult. Uh, would counsel kindly speak up so that the court can hear his examination? Isn't it true that you left the fundraiser to go to the Pioneer Motel where you had a violent argument with Luke Dixon and accidentally, accidentally killed him? Objection, Your Honor. Counsel is using this witness not to elicit testimony, but to engage in pure speculation. It isn't speculation, Your Honor. I can prove that Laura Robertson was at that motel. Then by all means, proceed. Do you smoke, Mrs. Robertson? Occasionally. Sergeant Austin testified this cigarette case was found here on the floor, below the window. But Mr. Robertson says when he tripped, things fell out of his pocket, over here, near the foot of the bed, across the room. You see, Glenn Robertson just assumed that this cigarette case was in his pocket when he tripped and fell that night. 
But it wasn't, was it? You had it. No, I... Look at this photograph. The photograph you identified as having been taken at the fundraiser. There you are with Jennifer Parker. Her watch says 920. What is that in your right hand, Mrs. Robertson? What is that? People's Exhibit 9, isn't it? It's this cigarette case, isn't it? Your husband didn't have the cigarette case that night. You did. And you dropped it in Luke Dixon's motel room. That is the truth, is it not? When Luke Dixon called my office, I found out that Glenn was going to pay him the blackmail. I decided to go to the motel before he arrived and try to get the file from Dixon. Your husband did not know that you were going? No. What happened when you arrived in Luke Dixon's room? He was surprised to see me. I tried to convince him to give me the file but when he thought he wouldn't get paid, he became ugly. I tried to take the file from him. He struck me. I fought back. He fell and hit his head. I panicked and ran. And you never told that to your husband? No. I allowed my husband, who has never given me anything but love and support, to stand trial. I used the loyalty and trust of my friends to protect myself. I succumbed to a consuming ambition and let it destroy everything that I felt. I'm sorry. Your Honor, in view of these developments, I move that the people's case against Glenn Robertson be dismissed. Mr. Resnick? State concurs. Case dismissed. All rise. Dixon's death was clearly accidental. Any lawyer can prove that. But if you and Laura need me, I'll be back. Thank you.
I realize it's an awkward time for me to ask, but I'd love to buy a dinner before I leave the city. I'd like that. Thank you, Sergeant. Call me Linda. I was sure with you representing Glenn, he wouldn't be convicted. I was right. I didn't want things to turn out this way. saw him again? Never. But I'm sure it was Krugman. You'd be willing to testify that if I managed to find him. Of course. But now I must go. Can't tell you how grateful I am you agreed to see me. It's beginning to think I was chasing a ghost. Unfortunately, he's very much alive. Au revoir, Captain Berman. Au revoir. Merci. heard a word I've said all night. Something about Cleveland? You're back in your Dita Krugman mode, aren't you? It's that obvious, huh? David, I know how badly you want to find Krugman. I mean, I know that's why you swung a transfer here. I know he did something terrible to your family. For God's sake, you've only been in Paris a few months, and the man's been missing for 45 years. You didn't expect it to be easy, did you? Of course not. Besides, but... you can't even be sure that Washington tip is valid in the first place. No, Krugman is alive, all right, and he's living somewhere here in Paris. That tip came straight from my friend at the OSI. Well, I've worked at the embassy for two years, and I don't know what that is. It's the Office of Special Investigations. They're the guys that track down Nazis living in the States. Anyhow, Elsa Ramsey was a Midenex survivor, and she saw Krugman here not more than a week ago. I never heard much about Midenex. Was it like Auschwitz? Uh, 
smaller, but yeah, just as bad. Anyhow, maybe this Elsa Ramsey made a mistake and it wasn't him. Then why was she murdered? Well, you don't know. She was. It could have been an accident. No, no. She spots Krugman, tells the Surete. I talked to her and 15 seconds later she's dead. That's no accident. You know, I mean, I saw it. That car deliberately ran her down. Say you're right, that Krugman is here. Well, you keep after him, you could wind up splattered all over the street or something. I don't want that to happen. She saw her mother and father. My grandparents, you understand? She saw them taken to the gas chambers. And her two brothers murdered, I mean, right in front of her eyes. Krugman would have killed her, too, if he had the chance. As it is, he pretty well left her crippled for life. I'm sorry, I didn't know. In fact, she just had another operation on her legs. I couldn't tell you how many that makes. It's funny, when I was a little kid, I used to think my mother lived at the hospital and just came to our house to visit. But how do you possibly expect to find him? You don't even know what he looks like, right? No, no one's ever seen a picture of him, even from when he was young. So, all you have is a sort of a rough description from your mother, and she was what? 13 years old at the time? I know it is not going to be easy. If it was easy, they would have found him years ago. But I have to keep looking. I just, I just have to. Can't you understand that? Of course. I just don't want to see you overshadow everything else in your life. Like us, for instance. Captain Berman, please. You will join me in the van. What the hell are you talking about? I'm afraid I must insist. I assure you I mean you no harm. David, don't. Don't be afraid. Captain Berman will be returned home safely. Now, hurry, please. Okay, I think you better tell me what's going on. I must apologize to you for what may seem as cheap melodrama, but sometimes we are forced to take extreme measures. Yeah, who the hell is we? You do not need to know that. All you need to know, Captain, is that like you, for years we also have been searching for Dieter Krugman. And we believe now that he is here in Paris. Where is he? He goes by the name of Altman. Felix Altman. A successful businessman. Well, if you're so sure he's Krugman, why don't you go to the police? He's a wanted war criminal. Because, as yet, we lack sufficient evidence. All we have are rumors and one inconclusive photograph. A photograph? We believed we also had an eyewitness. The same one you had, Elsa Ramsey. Look, if uh, you and uh, who you work with, if you're so sure you've got Krugman, then why don't you just find another Maidenek survivor that can make the identification? Because the death camp at Maidenek was just that, Captain. A death camp. Survivors were not the end product. That is why we need your help, Captain Berman. Me? We have sources at the police, at the Surete. They told us of your interest in Krugman. We investigated and learned that your mother is a Maidenek survivor. We would like you to bring her to Paris so she can make the identification. I don't know. When can I see that photograph? A rare picture and is obviously changed in 45 years, which is why we need your mother's testimony. Where can I see him? You can't see him at home or in his office. He refuses to see strangers. But we have learned that every Thursday morning he goes to a mineral spa outside the city. Where is this spa? It's called L'Eau de Dieu. It is near Barbizon. I'll go tomorrow. You have a car? I can borrow one. How do I contact you? We will contact you. And now you're free to go. Just as I promised the young lady.
Charlotte Major's a good guy. I just said I had some urgent personal business, and he gave me the day off. I still don't think you should go. I mean, if he is Krugman, then he's a very dangerous... Look, we talked that all out. I've got to go. I want to see what he looks like. That's all I want, really. You sure it's okay about the car? Yeah, as long as you don't go over 110. I'll have to pack my five. Maybe I should cop an urgent personal business plea, too, and go along with you. Well, I can probably get away, too. No, it's my problem. I'll deal with it. It's better I go along. Really. Here's the quickest way to get there. But make nice, huh? It's a classy joint. Come on, I'll show you where I parked the car. And you better get back to work. Don't worry. I'll be okay. Monsieur Rondeau, oui, de 26, donc de 15h30 à 17h30. Parfait. Oui. Uh, Parlez anglais? Uh, yes, I do. I have a message for Mr. Felix Altman. If you go through that door and down the stairs, you will find Mr. Altman in room 8. that you want here. Out with it. It's not important. If you have something to say to me, then say it. I have nothing to say to you. I think you do. You want to talk about my Dinek? Leave us, please. Who are you? How did you get in here? Doesn't matter. Ah, but I think it does matter. No, what matters, Herr Krugman, Krugman? is what you did at Maidenek. What are you talking about? You know what I'm talking about. My name is Altman. Felix Altman. Please, don't lie to me. I've seen your picture. You're Dieter Krugman. Oh, man, you're a fool. <laughs> Appelle la police. It's been over three years, Perry. Not since Dan's funeral. I know, Helene, and I'm sorry. We've been too long apart. No. No apologies necessary. But too long friends for that. Besides, I never contacted you either. There's still no excuse. <laughs> Stan will always be my closest friend. He always said you were the one who got him through law school. No. No, in class, he always took the best notes. But you. How are you? Fine. They tell me I'll be out of here in a few days. Same old problem? Now it's my hip. All the pressure from the bad leg. All right, Elaine. Why did you call me? You remember our son, David. Of course I remember it. Well, now he's a captain with the Marines. He's attached to the American Embassy in Paris. Not a bad assignment. He's being charged with murder. Tell me. He is accused of killing Dieter Krugman. The Nazi? The one from Maidenek? The, uh, the one who did that? Could you help him, Perry? 
France has a different code of law. I don't, I don't even speak the language. He, he told me on the telephone, he thinks maybe he'll be turned over to the military or a court martial. My associate will be on his way to Paris tomorrow morning. I'll join him day after. Oh, Perry, thank you. Thank you. In the first place, why did you go out there? Because after all these years, I, I had to see him in the flesh. I had to know if it was really him. And it was Dieter Krugman. His wife admitted it to the press. Besides, he pretty much looked like the picture. It's funny, I was expecting to see some sort of vicious monster. All there was was this pathetic old man. You don't know where the gun came from. I didn't even see it. I guess whoever shot him just tossed it on the floor. Could it have been the man who kidnapped you, the one in the van? David, we want to know the truth, all of it. Maybe in some kind of blind rage, you actually did kill him. No. You've been hunting him for years. You've been angry for years. You wanted revenge for years. Yes, but not that kind. Then what? I wanted to expose him to the world as, as the kind of monster he was, so that nobody would ever forget. What do they say, those? who don't remember the past, are condemned to repeat it. Mr. Mason, my dad said that you were the best lawyer he ever knew. Will you do it? Will you represent me? You're entitled to military counsel. But I'd rather you handle it by yourself, if possible. Well, David, it's been a long time since my court-martial days. But... I imagine it'll all come back. Mr. Mason. Lieutenant Fletcher, investigating officer for the court martial. How do you do? This is my associate, Ken Milansky. We've met. Mm -hmm. There's a rumor, Mr. Mason, that you're going to represent Captain Berman before the court. More than a rumor, we are. In that case, it's something you should know. We sent the gun that was recovered at the murder scene to Washington for testing arrived back this morning and it's definitely been identified as the weapon that fired the lethal round i would have expected that the serial number on the gun indicates it was the nine millimeter automatic issued to captain david berman the day he reported here for duty Glad to help, however I can. A thing like this reflects very badly on the entire consular service, even if it only involves a single Marine. You're talking about Moscow? Well, yes. And by the way, Mr. Mason, I must tell you that I have already been interviewed by Lieutenant Fletcher, and I'm afraid I had to tell him the truth. Good. The truth is that it was common knowledge within the embassy that Captain Berman had this... Obsession, you'd have to call it, about finding Krugman. Mr. Ambassador, thank you. Please send Mr. Mitchell in. Uh, here's some tangible help I can offer. Ah, Mr. Mitchell, come in, please. I want you to meet Mr. Perry Mason and Mr. Ken Molansky. They'll be representing Captain Berman at the court-martial. Gentlemen, this is Kurt Mitchell of our American Services Division. Good to meet you. Hi. Mr. Mitchell is a close friend of Captain Berman. And I'm assigning him to you while you're here. He can also arrange to get you some clerical help. You speak French and German, don't you, Kurt? Enough so that I'm not intimidated by the waiters. And enough to cut through a lot of bureaucratic red tape. Great. Since Della couldn't make the trip, Kurt can take her place. Della? I hope the change in gender won't be a problem. I think we can make the adjustment. But, yes, you can help us, Mr. Mitchell. Gladly, but please call me Kurt. All right, Kurt. Mr. Molansky has the names of some people we'd like to talk to. I need their addresses and their phone numbers. Is that people within the embassy? Oh, no. Potential witnesses. Altman's widow, the masseur at the spa, 
the family of that woman who was killed, Elsa Ramsey, and, oh, yes, one person at the embassy, uh, Kathy? Kathy. Kathy Bramwell. I'll get right on it. Now, Mr. Mason, I will do whatever I can to facilitate your stay. But I myself must maintain a totally neutral position with regard to the guilt or innocence of Captain Berman. Uh, what I mean is, I can't interfere with the progress of the court-martial. We wouldn't want it any other way, Mr. Ambassador. This is Berman's apartment. Look at this door jam. Obviously forced open. By whom, Mr. Mason? After Captain Berman left, the murderer could have broken in, found the gun, and then proceeded David to the spa. Where they waited for Berman to arrive and then killed Altman. Or Krugman, rather. While Berman was still in the room with him. That's right. Or Captain Berman could have forced it to open himself. So it would look exactly the way you just theorized. <laughs> Again, you're right. After all, Captain Berman knew the gun would be traced back to him. Why go to all that trouble? Why not just get another gun? Because as a foreigner, it wouldn't have been easy for him to procure one. And besides, he didn't have the time. According to his own story, he only knew Krugman was going to be there the night before. Mr. Mason, I'm afraid all this just won't help your case very much. David's goal was to bring Krugman to justice, not to kill him. Well, maybe French justice wouldn't have been enough for him. As you probably know, France doesn't have capital punishment. Is everything all right? Not really. I have those uh, telephone numbers and addresses that you requested. Well, thank you. Now I need a copy of the Uniform Code of Military Justice. I'll have one sent over to your hotel, Mr. Mason. Well, Lieutenant, thank you for all your help. No, ask anything you want. All right. All right. I know you were good friends with David's parents and all, but do you really think he didn't do it? I think he didn't do it. And as I told Lieutenant Fletcher, I think he never intended to do it. But he had a fixation and a great frustration about Krugman. Elaine told me all David ever talked about was trying to find Krugman, have him tried publicly in France under the... Crimes against humanity laws. Yeah, but why France? Why not some other country that has capital punishment? I mean, weren't most of the Maidenac survivors Poles and Germans? There were French nationals, too. Like Helene, like her whole family. That's right. So where do we start tomorrow? With the usual suspects. I'll start with Krugman's widow. You start with Kathy Bramwell. Yes, I've known for years. My husband was Didier Krugman. How did you find out? Before we were married, I was helping him to move from his apartment. And by chance, I came across his identification card of Madnik. So he had to admit who he was. He swore to me he intended to tell me before we were married. He wanted no secrets between us. And then he, he burned the identification card. He warned me people would always be looking for him. Madame Altman, did you know the kind of man Dieter Krugman was? I knew the kind of man people thought he was. And still you married him? You did not know Felix, Mr. Mason. He was a kind and decent man. It is impossible to believe he was the monster people claim. Aside from people who were looking for Dieter Krugman, did he have any enemies? Uh, let me put it this way. Did Felix Altman have any enemies? All successful businessmen have enemies, Mr. Mason. Any who hated him enough to want him killed? Well, there is one. I don't want to say he could have done it, but he was very angry with my husband. Go on. His name is André Marchand. And your husband found out André Marchand had embezzled several million francs from the business and fired him. How did you know that? Are the police looking into this embezzlement? Yes, of course. Thank you very much for your time, Madame Altman. Mr. Mason, 
You do not believe the American soldier murdered Felix? No, I do not. Do you have any pictures of your husband? I have none. He was always afraid someone would see the photograph and recognize him as Krugman. He led a very fearful life, monsieur. We both did. guys do that in New York. They mime in French, then? <laughs> Touche. Hey, how about that? Practically a native. Well, I guess we better get going. You probably have to be back at your desk. Anyway, you were saying you actually got the license plate number of that van? After I drove away with David, I wrote it down on a piece of paper. At least whatever I could remember. Then when he called me later and said everything was okay, I just forgot about it. Still have that piece of paper? In my pocket. I think it's important. Could it help David? It might. I remember there were a couple of sevens and a nine. I don't know. Anyhow, I'll get it for you. Can I tell you something else? I think I've seen that same van a couple of times since. Really? Where? When I went out shopping after work the other night. Then yesterday I... My God. There it is. No, still. Yes, I worked for Felix Altman for over 10 years. But this isn't one of his stores. It's mine. And it took all the money I made. Three million francs. That you were told I embezzled from Altman. You see, I know what they say. But you did not do that. For the past five years, Felix wanted to make me a partner in his business. Then, two months ago, he changed his mind. Just like that. So I made it pay myself a bonus. For the franc, exactly what I would have got if he had kept his promise. I consider it a fair settlement. Of course, he found out and fired you. Yes, but that was all her doing. Madame Altman? She made him change his mind about the partnership. Why? Because she is the most greedy and cold-hearted person I have ever met. In fact, it would not surprise me to learn that she was in some way responsible for her husband's death. She said the same about you. That does not surprise me. Do you know her history, monsieur? Well, I know she'd been a dancer in the Folie Bergère, and that she was much younger than her husband. When she became too old to appear naked on the stage, she seduced the old man into marriage. Why would she want him dead? His lately, the company had been losing money, and she wanted him to sell out so she could keep all her precious capital. But he refused, so now she can keep the company, oh, and collect the insurance. I see. Tell me, Marchand, did you have any idea Felix Altman was really Dieter Krugman? No. But he was always a very private, very secretive man. Meanwhile... You're facing a charge of embezzlement. 
which I'm sure will be withdrawn once all the facts are known. Well, they'll certainly have a harder time proving their case now that their chief witness is dead. Monsieur, I believe I am through answering your questions. Perhaps you are. Perhaps not. You'll have to excuse the way the place looks. I wasn't expecting visitors. Well, don't worry about it. Anyhow, I know exactly where I put it. Expecting visitors. You sure as hell had some. It's gone. The license number. They took it. Somebody is getting very proficient at breaking into apartments. It had to be the kidnapper. It would certainly look that way. Ferry thinks that your friends in the van weren't so friendly. That they might have set you up, framed you for Krugman's murder. Maybe, but whatever. I don't want you to involve Kathy anymore. She's already involved. She saw your kidnapper, and as far as they know, she saw their license numbers. Well, then you've got to protect her. We'll do everything we can. Hello, Della. Right on time. How are you? I'm just fine. How's it going over there? Still trying to sort our way through 45 years of history. Well, I suppose there's a worse place to do it. Oh, by the way, the district attorney is asking for a continuance on that Haskell case. Tell the DA it's fine with me. But did you reach the INS about Elsa Ramsey? That's what I'm really calling about. Elsa Ramsey was born in Poland, Elsa Brodsky. And later, during the war, she was in Majdanek. After that, she married a GI by the name of Arthur Ramsey. He brought her back to Ohio, to his hometown, and then later they had a baby girl named Marie. What happened to Ramsey? From all the information I can gather, he just dropped out of sight when the daughter was about 13. Where's the daughter now? She's living right there in Paris, working for a designer named Vicky Teal. Oh, that's interesting. Good work. All right. Enough about business. How are you? Are you all right? All right? Why wouldn't I be? Well, you know when you're over there, you eat that rich food. Rich food? Here in Paris? Della, you're imagining things. Say hello for me. Ken sends his regards. Meanwhile, I'll check with you every day. Give you a cholesterol count. You're bad, Perry. Bad. Bad, bad, bad. Bye, Della. I would like you to talk to a woman named Marie Ramsey. She's Elsa Ramsey's daughter. She works for the fashion designer Vicky Teal. Find out if she has anything that might link the Krugman murder to her mother's murder. Look, I don't want to sound paranoid, but I really am worried about Kathy. If that van is following her... Don't worry, David. Two can play at that game. What does it have, monsieur? Um, you, you speak English? Probably better than I speak French. Oh. Uh, what does a dress like this go for, anyway? 8,400 francs. Ugh. Wow, that's, uh, 1,200 bucks? Closer to 14. Your name Marie Ramsey? Mm-hmm. Mind if I ask you a few questions? About the dress? About your mother. Yes, I would mind. I don't like people who make me feel like a fool. 
Uh, wait a second. I've never been to a place like this before. I was curious about the dress. But that's not why you came in here, is it? You came in to pry about my mother. Look, I'm a lawyer from the States. I work with another attorney named Perry Mason. We're representing David Berman, the Marine who's accused of killing Dieter Krugman. And you don't think he did it? No, we don't. That's why I'm here. Maybe you better explain that. All right. We're trying to find if there's a connection between your mother's death and Krupp. He's the one who murdered her. What makes you think that? It had to be him. My mother didn't have an enemy in the world except for Dieter Krugman. And your mother thought she saw him two weeks ago on the street? She did see him. She went to the Sarate, but they said there was nothing they could do for her. But Berman had been making inquiries about Krugman, so I guess they told him and he contacted her. Uh, this is kind of personal. But after... After your father, after, after he... After he ran out on us? Why'd your mother bring you back here? Why not Poland? She couldn't face the memories. The nightmare. And she had friends here. Could you tell me about it? The nightmare? I'm afraid I have to get back to the showroom right now. I got all the time in the world. My mother was sent to Maidenek as forced labor, as a laundress. Maybe you don't know, but Maidenek wasn't like Auschwitz or Treblinka. Yeah, in what way? I mean, there was a death camp, but there was also an internment center attached to it. A concentration camp. That's where my mother worked. But Krugman was at the death camp. Yes, but because of my mother's duties, she had to go there to the other side. And Krugman was famous, if that's the word, even then. That's how she recognized him here. But how could she after 45 years? Well, she said he changed, but she could never forget his eyes. You looked into them and you actually saw the face of evil. Besides, she had a picture picture of her and a lot of the other might next staff including Krugman she said how ashamed she was being forced to pose for those animals but she kept it because she never wanted to forget how bad life could get uh, look miss Ramsey uh, is it possible I could see that picture you were talking about I've never seen it myself and I have stored my mother's things yeah it might be important I'd have to go through the boxes tonight or in the morning. Come on, I, I'd really appreciate it. All right. I'll come by and pick it up tomorrow. Hello? If I find it, why don't I just send it to your hotel? Molanski? No. Um, no. wait a second. That, that's me. Your name's Molanski? Molanski, Borowski. Maybe we're even related. Hello? Yeah, Perry. No kidding. Where? Okay, I'm on my way. I'll see you tomorrow. You sure must have a lot of pull with the ambassador to get me all this time off. He's being very cooperative. Anyhow, I'm so glad you're representing David. I just wish I could be of more help. If only I could remember that stupid license number. It may not be important, Kathy. But it is. This is far enough. What's far enough? Are you certain you could recognize David's kidnapper if you saw him again? Oh, sure. I mean, it was only a few seconds, but I'd know him anywhere. Look over there. A van. Why don't you give me the keys? No. See over there? Les gendarmes? Ah. Been following us since we started our little walk. Well, what can we do? What we can do has been done. Let's go. That's him. That's the man who took David. What do you want? Who are you? Who do you work for? I cannot tell you that. Then perhaps you would like to tell those gendarmes over there why you engage in kidnapping and murder. 
We do not murder. Ken, ask some of those fellows over there to step over here, will you? Sure. No. Wait. What is it you want? I want to know who you are and what you're after and who you work for. It will take a moment. You have just one. Sehen wir bitte. Ich bin hier mit David Bermans Rechtsanwalt. Er droht Ihnen mit der Polizei, wenn er Sie nichts sprechen darf. Also das. You'll be at the Trocadero at 6.45 tonight. A car will pick you up and you will come alone. I want some identification from you. A passport, driver's license. I'll return it tonight. Carl Meyerhoff. Well, Carl Meyerhoff, if that car doesn't arrive at 6.45, the Surete will be looking for you. The car will be there. Give him back the keys. I like it. You're taking a big chance. I'm sure before this is over, you'll both be taking a big chance. So you asked the Surete about Meyerhoff? Yes, but so far nothing. And I'm checking up on Daniel Altman and Andre Marchand. Oh, and I have a list of the court martial brass, most of them coming in from Brussels, from NATO. That car should be here. I still don't think you should go. Not alone. I agree. You don't know these people. How about Kurt and I follow behind in my car? No, if they spot you, they'll call it off. We can't take that chance. This might be it. You have a pen? Here's the number Meyerhoff punched in on his mobile phone. If I'm not back in two hours, give it to the Sorte. My orders are that you come alone. My friends just came to see me off. Can't make out the plates. Doing. He usually does, but tonight, I don't know. Chair for our guest. Uh, no, I, I won't stay very long. You... You wanted to see me, Mr. Mist. I don't know your name. Otto Rossen. That still doesn't tell me very much. Mr. Mason, have you ever heard of the Treblinka uprising in 1943? Yes. Almost 60 prisoners escaped the death camp. And I was one of them. I lived in the woods like an animal for six months. During this time, I made a promise to God and to myself 
But if I survived, I would spend the rest of my life tracking down the Nazi barbarians who visited their unspeakable horrors against the world. That's what you do now? For 44 years, I've been a hunter. I worked behind the scenes with your own OSI in Washington, with my friend Simon Wiesenthal, and with others all over the world. Wiesenthal and the others work out in the open, with the public. As did I, Mr. Mason, until a few years ago when our offices in West Berlin were firebombed and three of our people died. We've been obliged to go undercover since we came here in search of Krugman. I represent David Berman, charged with the murder of Dieter Krugman. I'm looking for the person who committed that murder. <laughs> you imagine it might be me or someone who works with me? Well, now that I know who you are, that conclusion doesn't seem unreasonable. Why should we want to kill Dieter Krugman? Because he's your prey, and France does not have the death penalty. Ah, but you missed two important points. First, we could easily have arranged for Krugman to be transported to a country where there is the death penalty. He committed crimes against the humanity of many nations. In truth, we regret that Krugman is dead. If he'd been captured and put on trial, the impact on the public would have been immeasurably more powerful. And Mr. Mason, the public, the world, must never be allowed to forget. But I still don't know why you have to go in for so much cloak and dagger, so much secrecy. Because as I told you, we had to go underground and because Odessa has a price on my head, a very, <laughs> very flattering amount, I must admit. You've heard of Odessa, Mr. Mason? A network of ex-Nazis and Nazi sympathizers. Many people assume that Odessa is only fiction, but unfortunately it's all too real, and its tentacles are everywhere. So this cloak and dagger you refer to is our means of preserving our security. <laughs> I'd like to see the picture of Krugman that was shown to Captain Berman. I thought you'd ask. Cal? Many of these butchers had very little trouble establishing new identities after the war. May I keep this? Of course. I know your reputation. And if Captain Berman is innocent, he has nothing to fear. I shall have you driven back to your hotel. I'm Mr. Mason. Good night, Mr. Rosen. Hey, good morning. Bonjour. Oh, yeah, whatever. <laughs> yeah, that's really beautiful. Look, you don't have to keep pretending. I'm not pretending, I like it. This is the only thing you really came to see. My mother's the one on the right. Which one's Krugman? She didn't say. She never talked about it. Too painful, she said. Anyhow, you keep it as long as you need it, but I'd like it back. Do you have any plans for dinner tonight? You don't need to do that. I know I don't. But I'm a stranger in town, and I don't speak the language, and I thought it would be nice to have dinner with a fellow American, especially such a beautiful one. I don't think that's such a good idea. Besides, I'm not American. I've spent more time here than in the States. I pretty well think of myself as French. Well, then do it in the name of closer U.S.-French relations. Think of uh, Gene Kelly and Leslie Caron. OK. Dinner. But no dancing through any fountains. <laughs> Darn. I'll call you later. Well, we sure got here a lot faster than I did the other day. Just wish I hadn't come in the first place. Let's go. They're expecting us. And I was standing right here, and the shot sounded like it came from right behind me. Next thing I knew, they grabbed me, and that's all I really know. Hmm. 
So, somebody could have fired from the back of that door and escaped unseen. Everybody who came in after that shot came through that door. Where does this door lead? To a storage room. Does it have an outside entrance? Hey. Well, that's one theory, Mr. Mason. But it's a bit hypothetical to convince the court martial. Lieutenant, you were right about that today, but today is not tomorrow. The court is called for 10 a.m. Let's go. What about the fingerprints on the gun? What about them? There were no fingerprints, you know that. But doesn't that work for David? Not really. Prosecution could argue how this cold and calculating defendant carefully wiped his fingerprints from the gun as his victim lay dead at his feet. And what does that leave us with? I mean, if David didn't do it, then who did? You tell me. Daniel Altman, for the money? Possible. We should check that insurance out. I've got some stuff on her coming in the morning. Andre Marchand? Mm -hmm. Another possible. Kurt, see if the Surete can verify his whereabouts the day of the murder. Okay. But my source says he may have some other important information on Marchand. What about Meyerhoff or this Otto Rosen? No. After what you told me, they're off the list. Who else? I got no idea. Maybe somebody we don't know of yet? Maybe another Maidenac survivor? There is another possibility. Who? Compare that photo with the one you got from Marie Ramsey. This one's from Rosen? Yep. It's the same face. So... Elsa Ramsey did recognize Krugman on the street and was probably killed for it. So who is this other suspect? If uh, your mother were murdered, wouldn't you want vengeance on whoever did it? By the way, Ken, how did your dinner go this evening? Very. There's no way she could have done it. Probably not. When you return that photo, do a little digging. Whatever you say. But I can't even imagine her being involved. Nor could I. Gentlemen, the court-martial starts at 10 a.m. in the morning. We'd like to speak to Madame Altman. I'm sorry. Madame Altman is in conference. And can I be disturbed? Again, see that we have an appointment, will you? No problem. Just a moment, monsieur. You can go in there. Actually, it's very easy. I've been here before. Remember? Hey, you'd better stay, Marchand. I'm glad to find the two of you together. It saves me a visit. What do you want? I thought we'd share some information. We're not interested. I certainly was. You see, the Surete has no report of any embezzlement by Marchand. I suspect there wasn't any. I think you'd better go now. What happened was your husband discovered that you and Marchand had been having an affair. You don't know what you're talking about. So he fired you and threatened to divorce you. If you do not go now, I will call the security. He was ashamed to let anyone around him know how he'd been betrayed, so he concocted the cover story of an embezzlement. After he was dead, it suited your purpose to let the story stand. When we talked, each of you pointed an accusing finger at the other to disguise the fact that you were lovers. Why would we do that? So nobody would guess you had a definite motive to kill your husband? And what would that be? Get him out of the way before he could divorce you. So you'd inherit whatever estate he had left, plus whatever insurance there was. The two of you would live happily ever after. It's lies, a pack of lies. Andre, please, be quiet. Mr. Mason, some of what you say is true. We are lovers. But we had nothing to do with the killing of my husband. I swear it to you. You may have to. In front of a court-martial that starts in half an hour. 
Bonjour. Yes, sir. As soon as the local surete was given proof that Captain Berman carried a diplomatic passport, both he and the gun found at the scene were turned over to me. And you had the gun sent on to Washington? Yes, sir, to Corps headquarters, along with the bullet taken from the deceased body. They forwarded both items to the Department of Defense, where Marine Intelligence made ballistics tests. Excuse me, Mr. President. Defense is willing to stipulate that the gun found at the murder scene was the same weapon that fired the fatal bullet. Thank you, Counselor. In that case, I have no further questions for Lieutenant Fletcher. No questions. Thank you, Lieutenant Fletcher. You may step down. Please call your next witness. Master Sergeant Frederick Hanson. The serial number on the 9mm automatic that Lieutenant Fletcher gave me corresponded to the serial number on the gun that I myself issued to Captain Berman on the 6th of August of this year. The date he reported for duty at the embassy here? You sure? I keep very careful records, sir. As a matter of fact, I brought them with me if you'd like to show them to the court. Defense will stipulate the gun that killed the deceased was the same gun issued to the defendant. Thank you, Mr. Mason. No questions, sir. No questions. Thank you, Sergeant Hanson. Colonel Calvelli, you may call your next witness. Sir, I'm afraid he isn't here yet. I didn't expect all these stipulations from the defense, and I told them 11 o'clock. Well... In that case, we'll call a short recess. Court will resume at 11.30. Colonel Calvelli, you will inform us if there are any additional schedule problems? Of course, sir. Is that good? Never hurts to run over the other side a little. We could use a little more time. Good news, Mr. Mason. At least I think it is. There was a 10 million franc insurance policy on Altman's life, and Danielle Altman is the sole beneficiary. Interesting. But that still only goes to motive. We need a lot more. I have things to do. Lieutenant Fletcher, why don't we all get a cup of coffee? Well, Mr. Ambassador, sit down. Mr. Mason. Things don't seem to be going well. I'd like to ask you for a little help. Certainly. Perhaps someone in the State Department could contact the Soviet Procurator General's office in Moscow. The Soviets? What for? The Russians liberated Maidenek in 45, and they'd still have all the records. I'd like to see everything they have on Dieter Krugman. You really think they'll cooperate? Yes, I do. But I'd appreciate it if you'd keep your inquiry as private as possible. I'll do what I can, but why do you need their files on Krugman? Well, so far I have a lot of questions and very few answers. Maybe the Soviets can supply some. Or maybe not. Yes, he seemed very intense. Very, I say, it, menacing. Objection. Calls for a conclusion. Move to strike. Sustained. The witness's answer will be stricken. What exactly did Captain Berman say? He said he wanted to talk to Monsieur Altman about... My Danek, is it? Mm -hmm. Then I left the room. But after I shut the door, I could still hear voices. Angry voices. Then what happened? Didier and I... Didier is the receptionist. We heard the shot, and we ran back to the room. We saw the Americans staring down at Monsieur Altman's body. Did you see the gun? Yes, it was on the floor, not far from the body. And this American that you saw, is he here in this courtroom today? Well, he's seated right over there. Indicating the defendant, Captain Berman. Sir, no further questions. Monsieur Dario. Would you tell us if there's another door to that room other than the one leading to the hallway? Yes. It leads to a room that's used for storage. 
And from there, there is a door leading to the outside. What? So, it's entirely possible that some other person could have hidden behind that door, shot Monsieur Altman, and then escaped without being seen. It is possible, I suppose, but I didn't see any such person. Thank you, Monsieur Dario. And neither did anyone else. I move that last remark be stricken. The court will please disregard the witness's unsolicited response. No, it's not going too well. But we haven't been up the bat yet. So will you be going right back to the States after the trial? I don't know. Why? Just thought since you were here, you might take some vacation time. Uh, I doubt it. Too many cases pending back home. How about you? How about me what? Oh, you think you'll come back? To the States? Why would I? Well, it was your mother's idea to come here and, uh, well, you know. I told you, this is my home now. But, uh, what if you were to get involved with some American? Where is it written that a woman has to follow a man? I mean, if a man truly cared, couldn't he think about relocating here? Makes sense, I guess. <laughs> Look, there's something I gotta ask you. Sounds a little ominous. Not really. After your mother died, did you ever try to find Krugman yourself? Why do you want to know? No reason. I mean, it just seems like it would be kind of a natural instinct to want to find Krugman. Bring him to justice. Is that what this is all about? You really want to cross-examine me, accuse me of murder? Marie, wait a second. No, you know what you are? You know what your problem is? You're a fake. You just don't say what you want. You always have to enter into some stupid little game. Marie, now, wait just, a just second. give me my picture back and leave me alone. is why anybody would want that picture so badly. Don't worry about it. The security people at the embassy made me copies yesterday. Good. Give one to Marie. Hello? Yeah, hold on. It's Ambassador Todd. Hold on a minute. Mr. Ambassador? Good. Yes, I hope so, too. And, Mr. Ambassador, thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> the Russians are cooperating. We should be getting their Krugman file by courier sometime around noon tomorrow. I hope it helps. France may not have the death penalty, but a U.S. court-martial does. I don't know that I'd call it an obsession. What would you call it? Objection. What she would call it is irrelevant. Sustained. 
But he arranged to have himself transferred to Paris, made repeated inquiries about Krugman at the Surete, even met with a woman who claimed that she could identify him. Now, surely that was more than just idle curiosity. Objection. Witness is not a psychiatrist. Sustained. Miss Bramwell, isn't it true that the defendant often said that no matter what, he had to find Dieter Krugman? Objection irrelevant and calls for hearsay. No. It goes to state of mind and motive. Overruled, Mr. Mason. You may answer the question, Miss Bramwell. Yes. That's what he said. No more questions. Miss Bramwell, what did David tell you was his ultimate objective when he found Krugman? Objection. No foundation or relevancy. Oh, Mr. President, it was Colonel Calvelli's inquiries that opened the door to this subject. Overruled. The witness may answer the question. He wanted a public trial, so everyone in the world would know what Krugman did. Did he ever say one word, one word, about wanting to kill the man? No. Looks like the prosecution will wrap things up this afternoon. Having proved their case, motive, weapon, opportunity. Here it is, Mr. Mason. Moscow. Our decoding people made a translation for you. Ken, bring David to the conference room. Does that help? Maybe the break we've been looking for, but I need more help from you. You know my ground rules. No, 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 believe me. Nothing will compromise your neutrality. I want serious cooperation from the local Surete. Well, Mr. Mitchell's been in touch with them. I'm sure he can... No, help. no, I... I don't think Kurt can handle this. For what I have in mind, the request has to come from the highest level. Besides, there's a question of time. Well, tell me exactly what you want to do what I can. David, I want your consent to bring your mother here to testify. What for? I mean, you saw her. She's just getting over surgery. I know. We'll make sure she's well taken care of. But what can she do? For starters, she just might save your life. What are you talking about? Who's this? According to the Russians, that's a picture of Dieter Krugman. No, it isn't. Why not? You've seen the picture of Krugman. This isn't the same man. Maybe he had plastic surgery. A lot of those guys did. That is Krugman, right? Yes. Both photos show a man in SS uniform. Now, why would he have had plastic surgery before the war ended? Okay, you're right, he wouldn't. But it doesn't make sense. That's why I need your mother here, to explain the discrepancy. She's very fragile, Mr. Mason. She's always been. She survived my neck. Okay. Yes, I, I talked to the doctor and he said it's all right for her to travel. But matter of fact, I think even if he'd said no, she would have come. That sounds like Helene, all right. When you talk to her, tell her Ken will meet her at the plane and she'll be staying at the Royal Monceau with us. Right, right. Uh, I think you should know, though, Perry, even with her faith in you, she's still very worried. Well, she's not the only one, but don't tell her that. Perry. Bye, Della. As you heard, I want you to meet Helene. I booked her on flight 1110, arriving early at noon. Please bring her directly to the embassy. What about the court-martial? Oh, Colonel Butler's giving us a one-day delay. Well, that's good. Good. Helene's testimony could be the key to this whole case. I 
any minute now. What you feel is a gun, and I will use it if you do not do as I say. Come on, let's go. You have friends arriving here, Meyerhoff? David, is that the man? Yeah, that's him. Sir, you're under arrest. See you more. Don't go now. Mr. Mason. Second, I thought everything got fouled up. Now what? We just let French justice take its course, head back to the hotel. Back to the hotel? What for? David's mother arrived two hours ago on the Concorde. Kathy's with her. train for three days. My mother and father, my two brothers and me, and probably 70 others in one box car, and no food or water the last day and a half. How old were you? Fifteen. My brothers were 14 and 17. Please go on. Finally, at dawn of the fourth day, the train stopped at Maidenek. They forced us to jump off the train. And I saw my mother and father shoved into a group of people and marched away. There were no goodbyes. I learned later they were taken directly to the gas chambers. Then my brothers and I, along with many other children our ages, were marched to some kind of a holding area. My brother Jean went up to this SS man and demanded to know where they had taken our parents. He did not answer, but he, he just raised this iron pipe he carried and smashed Jean to the ground with it. Then my other brother Alan ran to the man and he also was smashed to the ground. Then, then he kept hitting him until he was dead. Somehow, Jean managed to get to his feet and he, he went after the man, tried to knock him down. But the man raised the iron bar to hit Jean again. I grabbed this piece of glass and I ran at him. And I grabbed his hand and cut it as hard as I could. He screamed and shook me away. And then he brought the iron bar down on my knee. Then he went back to Jean and finished his killing. Then he raised the bar over my head. He would have killed me too, but... Another SS officer arrived Get up, and ordered it to move stand. all of us immediately stand. to the work barracks. He called the man with the pipe, Krugman. Opt Sturmführer Krugman. I never saw him again. But I will remember his face until the day I die. Thank you, Miss Berman. I apologize for obliging you to relive that day. Now, I would like you to look at some photographs, if you will. Of course. These are photographs, Mr. President, already admitted into evidence. They are identified in your packets as A, 
B and C. Mr. Prosecutor, do you have yours? Mm. Mr. Malansky, photograph A, please. Now, do you recognize that man? Yes, I recognize him. Could you tell us the name of that man? I do not know it, but it is the SS officer who came and ordered Krugman to take us away. He did not mean to, I'm sure, but he saved my life. But the man in that photograph is not Dieter Krugman. No. Photograph B, please. Now, do you recognize the same man in that photograph? Yes, that's him, right there. That man was known as Altman, Mrs. Berman. Felix Altman. But he is here, too. Who is there? Krugman. Right there. Photograph C, please, the Russian photo. And that man? That is also Dieter Krugman? Yes. Yes, that is the monster. That's Krugman. <laughs> I'm sorry, Mrs. Berman. I'm sorry. I have no more questions of this witness. Colonel Calvelli? No question, sir. That's all, madam. We thank you for helping us here today. And we'll take a ten-minute recess. Captain Berman, get permission to assist your mother. Yes, my husband's business was failing. What did he do about that? He was désespéré. He went to everyone he knew to borrow money. To find some money to keep the business going. Did he succeed? No. Madame Altman, I have a few more questions. But I must remind you that you are still under oath. Oui, I know. Madame, what was your husband's real name? Felix Meinheim. But he changed it to Altman. He did not want anyone to know he'd been stationed at Madnik. Then why did you lie? Why did you tell the authorities and the press after he died that your husband was really Dieter Krugman? Because someone threatened to kill me. And since Felix had been murdered, I did believe they would try to kill me too. Who, Madame Altman? Who threatened to kill you? A man named Karl Meyerhoff. What is your relationship to Otto Rosen? I work for him. And on his orders, did you kidnap David Berman? Yes. On his orders, did you follow and electronically eavesdrop on Miss Catherine Bramwell? Yes. On his orders, did you threaten Danielle Altman's life? Yes, but of course I would not have done it. On his orders, did you kill Elsa Ramsey? No, I've never killed anybody. I see. Tell me, Mr. Meyerhoff, why were you waiting for Helene Berman at the airport yesterday? All Rosen told me was that he wanted to talk to her before she appeared at this trial. So you were just going to spirit her off, and Rosen was just going to talk to her. That's what he said. Mr. Meyerhoff, did you know that Felix Altman was not Dieter Krugman? I only knew what Rosen told me. Did you kill Felix Altman? No. Do you know who did? No, but it wasn't me. I wasn't even in Paris that day. You can verify that. 
I already have. No further questions. Colonel Calvelli? No questions, sir. Defense calls Otto Rosen. Mr. Rosen, you do understand that your friend Meyerhoff has just testified. Uh, yes. When your friend Meyerhoff called you to set up our meeting, I noted the number he punched on his mobile phone. I called that number the next day, found it was the office of a very prestigious brokerage house here in Paris. Really? Uh, perhaps you made a mistake with the number, huh? Mr. Rosen, when we met, I asked why you were working underground. You gave me several answers, none of which I found satisfactory. I did some research. I found there'd been no bombing of any office in West Berlin three years ago, and that Mr. Wiesenthal had never heard of an Otto Rosen. Then came the question of identities. I'm grateful to the Russians for helping me sort it all out. Perhaps you will not be. I have no idea what you're talking about. Neither do I, Mr. President, and I must object to this whole line of inquiry as irrelevant. Irrelevant? Mr. President, the testimony of this witness is the essential part of our defense. And evidently, the defense is based on blue sky instead of on hard evidence. Mr. President, again, this is all irrelevant to the defendant's guilt or innocence. I assure the court, even the skeptical colonel, that the relevancy will quickly become apparent. Overall. Mr. Rosen, I submit that the office where we met was a total fake. A piece of theater you designed to convince me that you were a Jew and a Nazi hunter. Well, why... I submit, Herr Rosen, that you were and are neither. Why should you say that? I'm Otto Rosen, and I have been a Nazi hunter for 44 years. I submit, Herr Rosen, that your real name is Krugman. Dieter Krugman. Dieter Krugman, you're insane. I'm Otto Rosen. Mr. President, I beg this court's indulgence. I wish to bring into this interrogation at this time a witness, an expert witness, purely for the purposes of identification. Go ahead, Mr. Mason. Mr. Molansky. Otto Rosen. Dieter Krugman. I submit it was you who ordered Felix Altman killed and had his wife threatened. That is a terrible lie. You and Altman knew each other. You knew each other was here in Paris, both successful businessmen. You felt safe, didn't you? For one to betray the other, he would have to betray himself. But when Altman's business began to collapse, he became desperate. He came to you. He demanded money. Demanded money or he'd reveal your true identity. For Felix Altman, that was suicide. Yeah, it's an interesting theory, Mr. Mason, but a pity you have no proof for such wild charges. <laughs> I call the court's attention to the file from Russia entered as Defense Exhibit 3. You will note the description of Dieter Krugman. It includes the fact that he has a scar across the back of his right hand. Now, Mr. Rosen, I would like you to show the court your right hand. You've no right to ask me anything. I'm a French citizen. Show the court your right hand. Turn it over. I wonder if that scar could have been made by a jagged piece of glass in the hands of a little girl, some 
45 years ago. Now, would you please remove your glasses? Remove your glasses. Mrs. Berman, do you recognize that man? Yes. The eyes of the devil. Krugman. I have no further questions of the witness. I have no questions, sir. I'm going to excuse this witness and suggest the Surete take him into immediate custody. President, in view of the fact that the prosecution has made a prima facie case against the defendant, and that insufficient evidence has been produced to contradict any element of that case, I move for a directed verdict of guilty of murder in the first degree. I ask the court to defer ruling on that motion until after the testimony of my final witness. Mr. President, Defense counsel continues to play his excruciating little delaying game, tantalizing us with this whole parade of mysterious witnesses, none of whom have disproved in the slightest the case against the defendant. Uh, Mr. President, this case is much more complicated than Colonel Calvelli seems able to comprehend, certainly more complicated than any of us would wish. The charge against the defendant is very serious. I believe the court should give us every reasonable opportunity to prove his innocence. Mr. Mason, Colonel Calvelli's motion is somewhat irregular, but the point is well taken. If defense has some strong evidence to present us soon, let's hear it. Yes, sir. Call your next witness. Isn't it true, Mr. Mitchell, that although Ambassador Todd assigned you to work with Mr. Melansky and myself, it was you who asked for the assignment? Yes, of course I did. David's a good friend of mine. And you? Are you a good friend of David's? Excuse me? I can't excuse you. You know, a lot of things bothered me about this case. For instance, how did Meyerhoff know the defendant was going out to dinner the night he was kidnapped? How did the photo thief know Mr. Melansky was going to return the picture to Miss Ramsey that day? And how did Elsa Ramsey's killer know she had recognized Krugman on the street? According to her daughter, the only people she talked to were the Surete and the defendant. Suddenly, a great light hit me. You. You were the only one who knew all these things, because as David's friend, he confided in you. To be sure, you were the contact. I let you make the travel arrangements for David's mother. Sure enough, there was Carl Meyerhoff, waiting for her at the airport. The right time, the right gate. You're way off base, Mr. Mason. I had nothing to do with Rosen or Krugman or whatever his name is. How long have you been in Paris, Mr. Mitchell? Eleven years, why? Eleven years. Do you recognize this? It looks like a paper napkin. And on it is your handwriting, is it not? I suppose so. Suppose? Is it your handwriting or is it not? It is. Those are the directions you wrote down for the defendant the day he drove out to the spa to see Felix Hoffman. So? So, you've lived in Paris for 11 years. And yet you give your friend directions that will take him at least 20 minutes longer than necessary. That's not true. Not true? Not true, Mr. Mitchell? All right, maybe I made a mistake. No mistake. You gave David Berman faulty directions. You gave yourself time to get to his apartment. 
steal his gun, precede him to the spa, and lie in wait to kill Felix Altman. What possible reason would I have to kill Altman? Mr. Mitchell, on your personnel records, you're listed as the son of Wilhelm and Gisela Mitchell. Married in Milwaukee in 1956. Gisela, maiden name Krauss, immigrated to the United States in 1954. But your age here is listed as 37. That means that you're not the actual son of Wilhelm Mitchell, but a child of Gisela's from a former marriage. I would like to introduce into evidence a certified copy of a birth certificate obtained from the West German government. It lists the birth of one Kurt Johann Krugman, son of Gisela Kraus Krugman and Hans Krugman. In other words, Mr. Mitchell, you are the blood nephew of Dieter Krugman and a member of Odessa. That is a lie. That is a lie. Ein Mitglied von Odessa. Ja! Ich bin ein Krugmann. Und ich bin ein Top-Mitglied von Odessa. Und Sie werden sterben. You will die. Okay. Yes, sir. I move for a directed verdict of not guilty. Motion granted. The defendant is free to go. Hurt you. You're going to have to stick around a few days to fill in those blanks for the Surete. No problem. You ready? My bags are already in the taxi. I'll get mine. What are you talking about? Business. I have to go. Well, what about... I, I mean... Hell, this isn't fair. Well, I might still be there when you get back. Marie... If you think I'm going to let you get away without kissing you goodbye, you're crazy.